Gentlemen, are you ready to partake in a journey to enlightenment? A journey to the West? Well, folks at home, if you are, then I welcome you to another episode of the Tannel Tracers Podcast. As always, I am your host, Jay. And joining me are my two compatriots, Brian and Sandy. I mean, Tony. Gee, thank you. Sandy felt like the most fitting. I wasn't going to turn you into Pigsy, even though Pigsy's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm I'm not a lecherous pig demon who just wants to start shit for no reason. Yeah, I figured you'd want to be the horse dragon. No, that's not the horse dragon. Sandy is the river demon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sandy's the river demon. Yeah, yeah, the horse dragon is some of that. Some, I thought, see, for some reason, I thought I, I mixed it up and I thought Sandy was the horse. That's why I got so hyped. Yeah. I think he was just called horse. I don't Oh, he was just called know. horse? Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, but uh, yeah, just so you folks know, uh, if you haven't seen the uh, OSP version of the retelling of Journey to the West, uh, yeah, the horse is also a dragon. It's, it's wild. It's a whole thing. Yeah. We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, but the reason why I bring that up is because we are finally covering a show that we have been excited for ever since we reacted to that trailer, American Born Chinese Season 1 on disney plus mm-hmm. yeah oh yeah super excited for this one i'm a sucker for journey to the west stuff i mean you know like my mm-hmm. gateway to anime was dragon ball like many children of the 90s so oh, yeah. like you know mm-hmm. it has a special place in my heart and more specifically og dragon ball like Pre-Z, dude. Because like, you know, I not not to not to sound like the purist or anything, but like I saw Z a little bit first, but there was a period in time where like Z kept looping on Toonami, and eventually they just started showing old Dragon Ball to fill in the gap. Yeah, I I love original Dragon Ball. Oh no, I watched that one first, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe somewhere in. The attic. I have a uh, blue VHS. Oh, so the like the ago. oh the ocean dub one, nice. Yeah, so you know, big but, fan of Journey to the West. But yeah, like if anybody is a fan of shonen manga in any aspect, you have read something that has been influenced by Journey to the West. One Piece, Naruto, oh, yeah. Bleach. <laughs> Fucking Dragon Ball, like I've mentioned before. Uh, fucking Jujutsu Kaisen. Like, a mm-hmm. lot of stuff has Journey to the West references. Chainsaw and, Man! And, uh, Chainsaw Man got a shout out in the show! And even stuff like God of High School. Oh, yeah, and God of High School, yeah, yeah. Which is like super direct, because, well, that's a spoiler. Yeah. But if you know, you know. But uh, also, let's not also uh, talk. Forget to mention behind the scenes that uh, it's the director of Shang Chi, and features four of the actors from Everything Everywhere All at Once. Yep, uh, you know, Mich- 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 Price, Michelle Yao, uh, Stephanie Hsu, uh, the actor who played Short Round. I do not remember the gentleman's name. Wasn't it? And. Uh, um, no. Oh yeah, and uh, you know everybody's favorite old Asian Asian grandpa was the Jade Emperor. I was By not way, expecting that. My favorite episodes in this season was the whole big flashback episode. Oh, the seventies! Sl- yeah, we'll talk about the seventies flashback. I had a blast yeah. with that. Yeah, I had a blast. With and uh, I will, like I said, I did not see that coming. But the minute I heard the voice, I'm like, oh yeah, grandpa. Yeah, of course. From uh, Jackie Chan. No, he's Dao Long Wong. <laughs> Uncle is a different person. Oh, yeah, that's right. Dao Long Wong was the evil wizard who was Uncle's counterpart. Oh, right. My bad. Yep. But still, yeah. iconic actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. And also, let's not, all, let's not forget, he was also Poe's dad in the Kung Fu Panda trilogy. Oh, yeah. I probably got those two mixed up. Yep. Which is why I was thinking familial. Uh, no, that's fine. Mentor. Uh, but yeah. So, 
yeah we'll be talking we'll be talking about that we've got plenty to say like without even really going deep into it we all really like the show uh i mean we mm-hmm. were we were soft sells on this shit when we saw the trailer so you know definitely hyped to talk about it but first mm-hmm. before we jump into any of that we got to check in with our boy Brian and jump right into the news caveats before I get into the news because of as of recording this Comic-Con just happened since the strike was going on a lot of the news that came out was like video game and uh, video game and comic based and then also images which are a little bit harder to do here at least for the audio only people yes so I have curated this and then the second caveat is I do want to mention, because the strike again, we don't have any updates, but just one day, support the writers, support the actors, all of that. 100%. Get our, like, weekly caveat to that for when we're not even mentioning the strike to mention the strike. But yeah, so, um, at Comic-Con, smaller things were announced that we're going to be covering, and one bigger thing. Pause. Uh, yes. First one is, um... We finally got an update for uh, Superman freshman year. Spider-Man? It was announced. Yep, Spider-Man. Sorry. What did I say? Superman. <laughs> I mean, it Sorry. makes the confusion makes sense because Superman does have a new animated series out right now. Yeah. Anyway, but Spider-Man anyway, freshman year. Spider-Man freshman year. We have an update. We know what studio is going to be handling it. Okay. I believe their name is Polygon Studios. I've heard of Polygon Studios, but I think I've only heard of them when it comes to video games. Uh, Polygon Pictures, sorry. And uh, what they're known for is animating Transformers Prime. Oh, Prime was really good. Prime was really Tron good. Tron Uprising. Tron Uprising is highly underrated and very good as well. And several episodes of Clone Wars. Oh, cool. So... Spider-Man might be going 3D again. Well, you know, the technology's improved. Although, like I mentioned before, I didn't hate the MTV Spider-Man, so. I didn't hate it either. That shit's great. Yeah. (laughs) Edgy as fuck, but not terrible. It was actually a closer uh, adaptation to Ultimate Spider-Man than most. They even gave him the same stupid haircut. Mm Mm-hmm. Next up, we have uh, another one out of left field. In the world of reboots being announced, y'all will never guess what's going to be rebooted. What's that? Huh. Biker Mice from Mars. What the fuck? What? what? Is somebody's Dude. license expiring and they're like, oh, I forgot we had this. Well, somebody <laughs> special who was a fan of the series has decided to pick it up and use his production company to do okay. it. Seth Rogen? One Mr. Ryan Reynolds. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right, his Ryan. Production, his production company and FUBU will be putting together the new reboot. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Awesome. That is hilarious. You yep. go Ryan, Jin, a fucking mobile company, and now you're, you know, really dipping into production? I mean, you did with Free Guy and stuff, but, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, the last two news stories are both DC-related. Okay. Another one, weird out of left field, and then the big one. The weird out of left field is they announced... Something called Hero United. DC Heroes United. Okay. Is it, it, it's it, weird. Is this another MMO? Because DC Universe Online was fun no. as fuck. It's no, still... This... I know it's still going, but it's it's basically dead. This is weird. Oh. It's being done by a studio called Gen... Genvid. 
which is doing a lot of upcoming mixed media type stuff. Okay. Like Silent Hill Ascension. Oh, nice. Okay. I've actually and, been like looking forward to that. It looks very interesting. And what they're claiming that this is, DC Heroes United, is an interactive streaming series. Huh? What does that mean? Like that one episode of Black Mirror? Maybe, but more so, because basically what happens is this is going to be set in a completely new universe of the multiverse, Earth 212. Okay. And it's when uh, the Tower of Fate shows up in Gotham. Huh. Okay. The Justice League will arise All for the right. first time in this universe. And uh, so far announced is just the Trinity, but they're claiming in their sales pitch, which is like three, four paragraphs long, so I'll try to skim it, is an origin story for the Justice League that you get to decide like Oh, it's a build your own roster. Okay, cool. Well, not just one person though. It it's a it seems like it's gonna be a collective everybody decides collectively what happens. Oh like everybody, so everybody? everybody? Like everybody who watches no, that's it what I'm or saying. plays it? Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Everybody, everybody? Yeah. Okay, that's so, yeah, that's it's, fascinating. It's, oh, I think I know exactly what this is, Jay. Remember, yeah. uh, like the Telltale games where you have um, oh yeah, yeah 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 X, X percentage of people chose this choice. Mm hmm. I think it's something similar to that, what? but it, real it's time. something similar. Also, fuck you to mm -hmm. all the people who chose to mouth off to Alfred. You guys are monsters. Evil yeah. bastard. But the. The interesting thing is they say that uh, you can decide, like, the heroes' interactions with each other, maybe possible roster of the Justice League. Also, Lex Luthor's going to be involved in the story. And so you so you know my first question when you, bring up, when you bring up the fact that you can choose interactions, right? Can you oh, make God. them bang? Did you make I do not know. I do not think so. Boo! What uh, Boo. they have said, they have said that this will, um, when this is all over, it will set up a canon universe with the DC Comics realm, and the results of this will be like canon within that universe. I mean, forever. that's pretty cool. Uh, like forever. I said, that's pretty cool. It's fascinating for sure. And, uh, Where is this in the streaming at? Don't know. Please be Max. <laughs> yeah, please. And the only other thing that we know about this is that it's going to be featuring the art of uh, Terry Dodson. Ooh, Terry Dodson does great artwork. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Now, for the big story, I don't know if y'all have heard about this, but uh, at each Comic-Con, DC will announce their, like, next couple uh, animated movies. Yeah, yeah. So, we know the two animated movies for 2024. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're both pretty big. First one? Pause. Watchmen. Oh! Did they already do an animated Watchmen? Nope. I know they did the motion comic. Oh, it was the motion comic. Right. Okay. They've done a motion comic, a TV show, and Live action movie. Now they're going to be doing an animated movie. Okay. It, uh, is, is it like a two parter? Because Watchmen is long as fuck. Mm hmm. But also, they just announced that it's happening. Just the title. Okay. The other title, which we don't know anything about, which could get real interesting, is Crisis on Infinite Earths. Whoa! <laughs> Oh, okay. That's okay. a that's a tall See? order. But like, 
So my my only question is like they gotta like have it set in the 80s right and use like the 80s versions of the characters otherwise it's not going to make any sense if you use modern characters for crisis that just doesn't compute yeah my my brain is just trying to process it and it's it's shooting blanks that's just what's happening i actually there. like well i don't have them they were handed down to me i have i have the issues of crisis no, so, it still I holds up it's a good read well, yeah, I mean, most, like, event comics that are solid reads are always going to be solid reads. They're I mean, for a reason. almost all the DC crises are great, minus Countdown and Heroes in Crisis. Uh, God damn it. Yeah, I hated Countdown, too. Mostly because Countdown <laughs> then led into Cry for Justice, which is not a crisis, but I had a crisis after that. <laughs> um, comics readers at that time and those after had a collective crisis I mean I was a comics reader oh, yeah. at the time of Countdown and Cry for Justice that was the first event I got to like read month to month oh god and I was I was Big Satch they well, ruined my boy oh, damn. Yeah, and, and they killed Roy's daughter Spoilers, I guess. They did. Spoilers for a... 20-year-old event? Jesus Christ. And yeah, no, good job. was supposed to lead into fucking Final Crisis. Which Final Crisis is fucking dope. Uh, anyways. Mm -hmm. anyways. Uh, one last like, footnote before we leave, though. That is a side note to this story. Just so people know. James Gunn did confirm that this has nothing to do with his universe. Good, good. But DC always puts out banger animated movies, so I'm glad they're not stopping it. Yeah. And like, that's the biggest the advantage they have over Marvel. Marvel has not figured out how to make a good animated movie. I mean, they tried. Like, Planet I Hulk mean, is Hulk decent. Hulk. The Hulk versus little duology was decent. Uh, I like the Doctor Strange origin movie, but that's what about it. I? Oh, and and the Avengers, Avengers. Uh, the Avengers, uh, whatever the the children one is called, Next yeah, Avengers. Avengers. Yeah, Next, Next Avengers. Avengers. That was cool. Uh, but you know what's crazy to me? Like one of my favorites hmm. was uh, the Ultimate Avengers duology. Oh yeah, oh. I forgot that was a thing. Yeah, I actually enjoyed no. those movies because they were adapted in such a way that it made me like Ultimate Cap. Yeah. But in the animated movie? I mean, that, I mean that's what happens when Mark Millar stuff is adapted. That It's usually better than the source material. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but Ultimate Avengers 2 wasn't even an adaptation of anything. It was an original story. Yeah. Which was awesome. There. But, yep, and it featured it featured uh, for a lot of people their first sighting of uh, Black Panther. Oh yeah, yeah true. And the the idea behind T'Challa in at least an animated form of the Ultimate Universe was cool. It was interesting. Yeah, well, that was super dope. <laughs> but <sighs> Marvel does Warner need Bros. to step up their animated uh, animated game though, because like. Dude, you're yeah. owned by a fucking Disney. How do you not have a good animated property? Yeah. I mean, Focus that's not true. They have Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. That's good. That's a TV series, though, not animated. Uh, no, film. I said, but I said animated property. So, yeah, that counts as an animated property. Yeah, fair enough. Also, would but... you count? The Spider Verse movies? No, There's because that can, because that falls under Sony, and that's the only thing oh. I can give Sony credit for. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really interested in seeing what they're going to try to do with uh, the Watchmen 
animated film adaptation. Yeah, I, it, I'm it, hoping it's it, a two-parter it, like Dark Knight Returns, because like Dark Knight Returns needed to be a two-parter. Because also, here's another question that's running through my mind. Because Watchmen is a very mature comic. Oh yeah, are we gonna see? Are we gonna have to see Blue Dong for like an hour and a half? Yeah, it, that's a. Or is it just going to be him in a fucking speedo all the time? Or is so, he just going to be so, like a kid? Uh, oh, funny, sto funny story Could about you... Watchmen, real quick, since this is related to the story. Um, I've told this story to the guys before, but uh, when I when I was a teenager when I was a teenager and the uh, Zack Snyder Watchmen movie came out, because I was such a huge comic nerd, I, I begged my family to go see it, and obviously I couldn't see it myself by myself because it was a rated R movie so uh, I went with my family and my family took my younger brothers and then they just kept seeing blue dog everywhere and they walked out I stayed <laughs> which also just a little bit of a funny note could you imagine if your job was to animate the blue dog. <laughs> oh man, that guy, that guy or girl must have had fun. I mean, look, we know that some animers, animators are horny on me. Right? I mean, yeah, look at all the Di look at all the Disney hidden sex references. Yeah. Also, uh, fucking most anime studios. Most of those well, anime are is known for being horny on main. No, no, no. But they can at least. But the folks at Mappa, in particular, make things fucking beautiful. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, that's true. They turn horny into art over at Mappa. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And on that note, news is over. All right. So jumping from news, finally gonna get word from you guys. We did not forget about you. We just got caught up in our, like, long-ass therapy session, which, God bless you if you actually sat through the whole thing. Uh, you are a true legend, and we appreciate yeah. you. Exactly. Good God. So, we are gonna now jump into our brand new segment, Comments Corner. All right, we get to hear from you folks at home. So, Tony, why don't you start us off? Well, this is from our uh, strange fake uh, Whispers of Dawn episode. Or Hoculus, again. Uh, welcome back. But he says, another thing I can say is, I like the difference the V... Oh, come on, wake up. VA does for Enkidu as themselves over their performance as Kingu. Yeah, no, the, the, there there is a hu there is actually a, a nice subtle difference between the Enkidu portrayal and the Kingu portrayal from Babylonia. You can tell that this is the real Enkidu, you know, quote unquote <laughs> real Enkidu. It was a nice subtle touch. I enjoyed it. You got any uh, thoughts on that, Tony? Well, since I didn't watch Babylonia adaptation. Oh, you did? I don't have anything to say. <laughs> oh, wow, you did? It's really good. <laughs> That's what got me to play FGO in the first place. Yeah, it's and, just uh, there, during that time, I was more fat focused on other shows. Gotcha, gotcha. Makes sense. And I didn't watch either, so I can't comment, but I do appreciate the comments. Yep. All right. Yeah, cool. but if I ever catch Babylonia, which more than likely I will in the future, I could see if there is a subtle difference between the performance. But regardless, the performance was great all the same. As someone who watched both, I can I can confirm uh, his comment is correct. Yeah, it was it was really dope. Uh, I I especially like because like I mean even if you uh, even if you didn't watch Babylonia. If you pay attention to like the like dialogue from like the story chapter of Babylonia, a lot of the speech and mannerisms are different versus how we heard Enkidu in 
uh, you know, strange fake. Well, that makes sense. Because it was just Kingu pretending to be Inkadu in the grand scheme of things. So, yeah, I can see that. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, it's really cool. And don't worry, folks, like we mentioned in the video, a Strange Fake will be a uh, one that we cover episode by episode uh, whenever they decide to drop more episodes. Yeah, it's sometime nebulously in the future. Yep. Hopefully we hear about it sooner than we hear about the extra remake that apparently doesn't exist. No, I'm not salty <laughs> at all. Good God. Uh, anyway, you know, But at least they're getting a uh, remake of the first game. Again. Yeah. And I'm super hi and I'm super hyped for Samurai Remnant. But oh, yeah. moving on, yeah. moving on from fate, we're going to jump into the next comment. And this comment is from Purity. And Purity says uh, it's also on the Kong Skull Island video uh, for our Kong Skull Island episode. And Purity says, Loving this show all the way from Kenya. That's awesome. I'm glad we managed to convince you to watch it. I'm really glad you're enjoying the show. More people need to watch the episode Indeed. and watch the show. Not just because I, I want views reason. and watch time. <laughs> it's because Kong Skull Island is a great animated series. Yeah, that yeah. show was... And we need a second season. Yeah, we do need a second season. 100%. Too many cliffhangers. Where the fuck is Dog? Yeah, I want to know what... Him. He was one of my favorite things about that show. Yep. Yep. But yeah. Like, what happened to the rest of the lads? Yeah, I... I, I uh, like, is, Char is Charlie... Is, like, is Charlie good? What 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 the, what the fuck ha what the fuck happened to uh what, what's what's I can't remember the friend's name off the top of my head. Uh, Matt. Oh Matt. Mm -hmm. Matt. Yeah. Matt. What the fuck happened to Matt? Is Matt cured from his like giant squid poisoning? Also, what happened to Cap? Yeah, where's Cap? Where's mm -hmm. like all we saw was Annie and Annie's mom. Yeah. Who debatably they has it going on? I. I I wasn't really yeah. feeling it personally. Yeah, but God yeah. damn it! Why did we did we end the show on the biggest fucking cliffhanger and not tell and having to sit on our thumbs just waiting, waiting? Oh yeah, waiting. No, th this oh. this is why I hate fucking cliffhangers, and we'll get we'll get deeper into that later in the episode. Uh, yeah, but oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, again. Glad you enjoyed the show, uh, and glad glad uh, we uh, glad we did our job and convinced somebody to check this awesome show out. Appreciate the comment. All right, thank you. Now we're gonna move on to trailer talk once again. Trailer Talk, for those of you who are new to the podcast, is the segment where Brian has curated for us a playlist of trailers, and we take a short break and then give, come back with our rapid-fire thoughts on said trailers. And for you folks at home, at least the ones on YouTube, Brian will leave a link in the description to said playlist so you can check those trailers out too. So, you know, pause the video here, Watch watch the playlist and then come back. But before you pause the video, Brian, what trailers will they be reacting to? All right. So we've got interesting, mostly animated, honestly. Yeah. Uh, Weird. You, you mentioned to me that uh, one trailer might. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll get. We'll get to that. But first, we got the new Harley Quinn trailer. Yeah, I love this series so fucking much. Yep, and and it's not over yet. We got a new Adventure Time. I saw it. I, well, I didn't see it. I saw a thumbnail. I'm hyped about that as well. Then uh, we got another Mortal Kombat Legends animated movie. Oh, okay. nice! This time, this time, it's. 
the lovable asshole Johnny Cage. Nice. I love the Scorpion one actually. The Scorpion one was really and, good. And and to voice the lovable asshole, they have one of TV's go-to lovable asshole actors, Joel McHale. Oh shit! That actually makes perfect sense. Hmm. Yep. And then, as Tony was alluding to, we have the season two trailer for Invincible. Yeah, boy! Super hyped! I did not see it, but I saw thumbnails. Tempted to click. And then, and then, um, because we reacted well to the last comic uh, trailer, we got a new one. Batman. Gargoyle of Gotham. Ooh, interesting. If they knew, if they knew, um, a black label series. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. And then uh, we got a new, tra- we got a debut trailer for Walking Dead. Daryl Dixon. I don't really care to be honest. Which uh, the Dead City one kind of surprised us. Yeah. But I'm not really interested in Daryl. Daryl is my least favorite character as much as I actually like Norman Reedus. I'm interested in it, but not because of Daryl. Because oh, be- oh because he's traveling Darryl. around the world? Nope. Not traveling around the world. Oh, he's in France, he's right? Lost it. Yeah. He just randomly sh- How the- shows up on the shores. How the fuck do you get from Atlanta to France? Uh, well, you know what? I don't care. Then, then, the first big trailer, the biggest trailer of Comic Con, One Piece. Yep, the first official full trailer for One Piece. I'm, I'm, I'm super hyped. Yep. Also terrified. Give you a warning there, Tony. Yep. There's some terrifying stuff in there. Oh God. Great. Yeah, and uh, and I could say the same for the last trailer. Oh but no! Terrified in a different way that is uh-huh. only unique to this universe. Okay. And we got the debut first official trailer for Gen V. Oh shit! Nice. I'm the, excited uh, for this spinoff. The college spinoff of the boys. Yep, I'm excited for this spinoff. Oh, uh, this okay. one feature this one featuring Patrick Schwarzenegger and two alums from the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Oh yeah, yeah, right. I remember because uh, it's uh the the chick who played uh what's him called the, the the lead sister. I forget what her action Prudence hmm. Prudence right Prudence. No. Oh no, it's a uh, Agatha and Dorcas. It's, uh, no, it's a uh, whatchamacallit, uh, the best friend who was an oracle. Oh, the one who like lost her sight. I don't remember what her name yes. is, but yes, I remember her. Her, her and uh, Ambrose. Oh, cool. Ambrose was awesome. I loved Ambrose's character. Yeah, Ambrose. Yep. All right. Well, sounds like we got a, a good bunch of trailers, and you guys have a good bunch of trailers to react to yourselves. So, like I mentioned before, pause that video and uh, go check out that playlist in the description down below. In the meantime, we'll be back with a vengeance, maybe. And we're back. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the trailers as much as we did, because once again, it was a selection of bangers. Good work, Brian. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, seven and eight ain't bad. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can't it win them all. Good. But, um, uh, which, uh, uh-huh. starting with that one though, real quick, plot was kind of bad, not good, but it looked pretty. Oh, it looks very pretty, but it's just the plot of Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, and, me, and, it ha- and it's just with us. Norman Reedus. And I'm gonna be real with you, yeah. I enjoyed it with Nicolas Cage because it was Nicolas Cage. Yep. I don't know if I would enjoy it with Norman Reedus. No offense to Norman Reedus. Yeah. It's uh, that one fucking Kermit meme. I'm going to keep it real with you, Chief. <laughs> right. 
Oh, but man. it's already been renewed for season two, so... I think that's just because you they're know. banking on the popularity of Daryl. More than likely. Also, the fact of um, um, Dead City has been killing it. Ah, uh, okay. Um, Which, that has already been renewed for season two. Oh, and cool. just had its finale. Oh, okay. Good for them. Well, the uh, fucking... What, what's the actor's name? John? Jeffrey Dean Morgan? Yeah, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Good on that guy, because talented, talented he's actor. A, no, he's a wonderful actor. He he, mm-hmm. he was a spot on Negan. He was he was great as the comedian. And Daddy Winchester. Yeah, of course. Yeah, his most iconic role to me will always be Papa Winchester. Um, yeah. Oh, he played, yeah. He played Daddy Winchester. Yeah, he was Papa Winchester in like the early seasons of Supernatural. Oh hell yeah! Yeah, that was him. Yeah. Like pre blow up. Got and uh, pre before that, he was uh, kind of a uh, your um if you won Sean Bean, but not that same amount of money. Yep. Like, like yeah, go to yeah. Uh, he was very much the we have he, Sean Bean at home. Sean yes, Bean. I mean most iconic out of that group being uh, the Hillary Slank P.S. I Love You uh, where he died yep. even before the credits rolled. Classic. Classic. Damn. But yeah. Damn. So let's, 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 talk, let's talk about the ones we liked. Uh, Generation V. Holy shit. It look, I'm, I was already hyped for it, but it looks dope as hell. What the fuck is up yep. with those puppets? Yeah, yep. what the fuck are in the puppets? I have and, so many questions. Like, is somebody yeah, super power to turn people into puppets? Is this some kind of weird <laughs> acid trip? And Dude. why do I I need a cigarette after all that nonsense? It reminds me of uh, that one movie we watched in Discord for movie night, The Happy Time Murders. <laughs> you guys remember that? Oh, I know I wasn't there for that, but... What the fuck? <laughs> oh, dude, that shit was hilarious. They like, they like splooge silly string. Oh, uh, what? Yeah, the dude splooge silly string. Like the the one puppet detective who's our who's our like main lead. He was like, f- he was like fucking a, uh, a another a lady puppet in his office, and then you just see fucking white silly string everywhere when he finishes. It's hilarious. I wasn't there either. Oh my god! You oh we gotta then we gotta definitely watch Happy Time Murders. That shit is that shit was hilarious. Me, David, and Darth had a blast. But I heard about it. Oh, Uh, I will say, it's the funniest thing I've seen Melissa McCarthy in in a long time. Yeah, but uh, back to Generation V. I did hear, even though it's not happened yet, that fan theories are already coming out. Like, um, some people are theorizing, like, what if the main homegirl is the key to stopping Homelander? Oh, interesting. Right. Because she can bloodbend. Yeah, true. Uh, We also had a conversation off camera that I will not repeat because of YouTube, but Mm -hmm. I have questions about her powers. Very specific ones. Yep. But, you know, hopefully they'll get answered. Because the boys likes to answer those graphic questions that, you know, people think about with superpowers. We don't know any of the superhero names, for one. Mm -hmm. The the guy with the glowing eye, which, by the way, is Patrick Schwarzenegger. Yep. He is a golden boy. Oh. Golden boy. Cool. Well, and it makes me wonder, speaking on that, is what other superhero pastiches are we going to see in this show? Yeah, you know? this is com- this is completely unique. It's not like part of like the boys like comic universe. So like they mm-hmm. have like complete free reign here. Yeah, oh yeah, so for real. And uh pastiches that they want. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and uh Clancy Brown is a professor. Right? He's who I would get for villain 101. 
Because, I mean, uh, like, <laughs> come on, his most iconic voice is fucking Lex Luthor. Yup. And I think out of all of the Lex Luthers that have been in just more recent media in our generation, we, some Lexes just surpass others. Not gonna lie to you. Yeah, but yeah, you, you know who you know who made about... a perfect Lex, like yeah, because like exactly basically the role he plays in every TV show ever except for Kaleidoscope. Fucking Giancarlo Esposito in the Harley Quinn season four trailer. Uh, this looks fun as fuck as per usual. I love that they're continuing all the shenanigans with the Bat family and then Harley and Ivy's like work conflict is going to be interesting mm -hmm. i love that nora is still around i think nora is hilarious um oh yeah indeed also it wasn't shown in the trailer but i did hear that season four is also going to go into like uh the bit of identity crisis that alfred is having oh yeah i wonder Alfred's if he's going to continue being more. yankee doodle because he also now no longer as Master Wayne to serve. Yeah, but he's got Damien. Damien can't fend for himself, the little shit. True, true, true. But yeah, a different point about that. And also, can we talk about Snow Blame? Oh, Fine. man. And then, well, and then, like, uh, the, like, uh, look, I'm, t I'm 12 on the inside. The dick joke made me laugh. Hmm. Well, not just the whole dick joke. Yeah. yeah. All I was reminded of was fucking Bezos's fucking dick rocket. Oh, Shoot yeah, up. that's true. That's well, probably but then where, Nora, where the joke is coming from. But then, Nora, I hope the clouds have a good gag reflex. Oh, that was really... Look, I'm telling you, like, I know Cap had a problem with Nora for a little bit, but we, like, we managed to, like, convince him. But, like, I'm glad Nora actually is going to be a more active participant in, in the season. Also, we're going to get mm -hmm. more Bane. The best character yep. in the show. Don't at me. So, yep. what you me here is, gentlemen... That I'm looking forward to fucking insanity. Oh, trust I, me, Tony. It's a lot oh, yeah. of fucking insanity. And a lot of fucking... I do recall, oh, yeah. I do recall the first season, because I think I watched it with you, Jay. Didn't, didn't we? We did do a watch through, yeah. For the for, for season one. Because cause Seto really wanted to check it out. Um, yeah, so... Also... Just... You yeah. go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say, also, our animated insanity does not stop there. Two more things. Oh, yeah. Fucking yeah. Invincible. As a huge fan of the series who loved the first season, super hyped. And God, all those names. Jesus Christ. I'm I'm really excited. What? Yeah. What? Knowing their audience, knowing their audience. They saved Peter Cullen and J.K. Simmons for last. Yep. Okay. Yep. And Josh in in this too. Uh, for oh Jesus yeah. Economic. Oh yeah. It's th yeah. Josh Peck is in this. No, Josh. No, Keaton. Josh Keaton. Oh, Josh Keaton. Yeah. And have you heard the fan theory? What's that? People are thinking that uh, who crossed over with Invincible in the comic. Oh, yeah, true. Wait. Who does Josh Keaton voice? True. Like, oh, my fucking God. Are they really going to try to pull that? That would be amazing if they could do it. Uh, but, yeah, super hyped. The Viltrumite War is a fucking amazing arc. Big turning point for Mark's character, uh, both uh, maturity-wise and, um, you know, as like a superhero um what people don't understand mm -hmm. about invincible that i like i saw a lot of takes when the uh when the when the first season of the um animated series came out what people don't understand about in invincible it's not a deconstruction of 
the Superman archetype like everybody thinks. It's not like the boys where it's mean where the boys comic is mean spirited and written by somebody who clearly hates comic superheroes because that's the only way he could pay his rent and he's resentful for that uh and it's that's not even conjecture he said that in interviews um but with invincible uh robert kirkman is a true blue comics fan you know, yeah, sure, he's made some, like, super edgy shit, like, he wrote Marvel Zombies, and he created literally the irredeemable Ant-Man. Uh, yeah, and also uh, Walking Dead. Yeah, and Walking Dead, but I felt like that was self-explanatory. Everybody knows Robert Kirkman was Walking Dead. Which, uh, by the way, uh, he he opened recently in an interview that he wanted to really shock comic book fans. And initially tried to pitch Rick dying in season one. Oh shit! Wow. Uh, oh, but yeah. Also, uh, the point being, like, word Invincible word? is actually like a love letter to the Superman archetype in a way, because the point of Mark's character arc is all this fucked up shit keeps happening, and Mark still retains his hope for humanity all throughout he mm. remains a paragon he remains that like a beacon for the superhero community and for just the planet and galaxy in general like yeah this story is about why the superman archetype is important and not as boring as a lot of people have been led to believe and mm -hmm. also it talks about a lot of the things that, you know, most modern writers don't really pay that much attention to these yeah, days. Yeah, I, I honestly love the love the details and world building of Invincible. Like, you know, we saw in the first season the the tailor, you know, the the Edma Edna Mode esque character who designed all the hero outfits. Yeah. And the little things here and there that will come up later like we'll see characters like cameo early on and then go back up big time later mm -hmm. on yeah but yeah super excited for invincible season two cannot wait for that that's high on my anticipation list speaking oh. of stuff that has risen on my anticipation list if ever so slightly the one piece trailer so i'll i'll be real right off the bat everything for like 90 5% of that trailer looked great. Buggy continues to be the stuff of my nightmares. And you know what? I've just learned to accept it. Um, like, Luffy, the, the actor who plays Luffy, uh, Inoki Godoy, fucking pitch perfect casting. That dude's personality really shines through. He feels very Luffy. He feels very much like that childish, goofy himbo who knows when to turn serious mode on, especially when you fuck with his friends. And his delivery of Luffy's catchphrase was, oh man, that brought a big smile to my face. I'm Luffy, and I'm going to be King of the Pirates. I fucking love it. Um... Uh, <laughs> The shots of Mihawk, super cool. Shanks looks good. Gold, uh, Gold Roger looks amazing. Costume department, 10 out of 10. You even got the mustache perfect, which is super important. Yeah, because um, that mustache was on point. Yep. Love that. Uh, I thought the comedy showed in the trailer was also really good. My oh, and, and the stretching animation has improved both for Luffy's attacks and the little practical effect they use when he's like stretched out his mouth. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. But the one my one complaint. Come on, costume department. You were doing so good. You were doing so good. You even gave the bird. You even gave the news coup the mailman hat. How do you fuck this up? Arlong. It looks like you're setting up Arlong to be the main villain of this season. He's the big guy. So why the fuck 
does he look like great value, Arlo? Uh, you know, I don't really agree with Twitter very often, but like, I'm with Twitter on this one. He's not R long, he's R short. He's so tiny <laughs> and like scrawny. He's supposed to be a big, intimidating shark man. I did not get the vibe of big, intimidating shark man from the R long we saw in the trailer. Also, the voice sounded very try hard. I uh, at least for me, I, I don't know how the, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but like I, it was not gonna lie, kind of like somebody trying to do a uh, Darth Vader impression. Exactly, you're tr you're actively <laughs> trying to be the bad, like do the oh this is my bad guy voice. Oh no 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 no! I'll do a little bit a big step further than that. It's like when you're doing a, a Power Rangers Monster of the Week voice. Uh huh. And then when you get to the big bad of the season, they have that same gravelly voice. Yeah, he like he feels very one note, which is not the case for Arlong. Like I'm not gonna go into major details. But, like, his arc deals with a lot of heavy stuff politically in the One Piece world. And I hope they treat this character with care. Because, like, yes, he's only really relevant in his arc. But his arc has rippling, uh, like, a ripple effect that, like, carries over hundreds and hundreds of chapters later. So if you fuck up Arlong, you fuck up a lot. <laughs> Especially because he's super pivotal to Nami's character arc. Which, by the way, the scenes with Nami in the trailer, fantastic. And they got the scene with Nami in the trailer. If you're a One Piece fan, you know the scene. I already know I'm either going to get teary-eyed or just straight up cry. Because I cry every time I see the anime version. Uh, but super hyped. Uh, like, I'm still keeping my expectations really low for uh, One Piece uh, live action. Because this is still the same studio that fucked up Cowboy Bebop so badly that the creator like had to be like, Yeah, uh, they wouldn't even let me on set. So, uh, my name is not actually attached to any of this, but, uh, you know, to give One Piece live action a bit more credit, Oda has had a firm guiding hand in terms of the production, as far as we know. Pause. So, yeah, definitely. That was crazy. Uh, but, so... I definitely have more faith in One Piece live action, and I'm, like, more interested now than I was when we saw the teaser, but I still gotta keep my expectations low. I'm not gonna let them get me again. Yeah, it's kind of like, All right. uh, kind of like in a, when you're doing, uh, just talking to a very, very toxic ex. You know they're terrible. Exactly. You know, you know that's the analogy I made with uh, for my relationship with the Star Wars uh, Star Wars franchise. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you you've hurt, you you've hurt me so much, Star Wars. But we had so many good times. I keep coming back, and I keep getting hurt. But I'm still coming back. Oh God. Uh, but. But at least with this analogy, it's sure it's toxic, but it's at least in the, in the sense that you know for a fact what you're getting into. Yeah, no, I, like I said, I'm definitely more hopeful for sure. Uh, our, oh, oh yeah, so Batman Gargoyle of Gotham, you're not pressing the button, Brian. I thought I was. <laughs> it's I was okay. pressing the button right below it. You were saying? But, uh, I was just going to say, uh, well, Batman Gotham, that was not 
anything, honestly. We just saw a really cool graphic. Yeah. It tells me absolutely nothing about what this series is. Yeah. It, but it, uh, my thought... I will say... Oh, go ahead. You know what my thought was when we were watching that teaser? What's I was that? like, it is Bruce becoming a gargoyle? Is he going to be like the gray gargoyle? That's what I walking? thought too. I was like, so, so like, did he get cursed and he turned, he's turned into an actual gargoyle? Like, is that what's going on? I don't know, but from what I saw, it looks like it's going to be about him, like, giving up being Bruce and just being right. Batman. Oh, we've all, we've we've all seen how that works out, but mm -hmm. okay, yeah, well. There's a reason why it's a 17 plus black series. I mean, well, yeah. And here's but my is next this question. one also going to show Batman's wing? Because <laughs> oh, you know the the Justice League Dark uh, black label Batman book showed Batman's wing, and everybody threw a fit over. I did not want to see Batman's junk. Mm -hmm. To the fact I mean, where they've uh, digitally edited yep. now. If you have, if you have an original printing of uh, Justice League Dark, uh, I forget what the subtitle is. Uh, then you have a rare, you have a rare copy. You save that shit. You you have comics mm -hmm. history, right? You have, yeah, exactly. You have the first ever full full frontal Batman scene. Treasure that. But here, here's a here's a my next question that does not concern superhero genitalia. All right, fair. Is this an Elseworld story? Maybe because Black Label's a little weird because like yeah. a lot of them yeah. are Elseworlds, but some of them are like nebulously in continuity. And the art style matches the current art style of the Batman ongoing that's happening right now. So, like, I'm going to say a maybe. It, it's nebulous. So that's what I'm kind of wondering, because... I, I think they're doing it kind of like how the old school um, Batman graphic novels used to do it, where it's not canon until it gets popular enough where it becomes canon. Like, The Killing Joke originally mm -hmm. was an Elseworld story. Hmm. And then it got super popular, and they're like, well, it's canon now. All right, so, um... But aren't we forgetting another? Uh, oh, no, Brian's well, looking up information on Gargoyle. This, okay. It's Raphael... Uh, Raphael... Albuquerque? Grandpa. Yep. Oh, oh, Raphael Grandpa! Okay. Gr or, I think it's Grandpa. Yeah. I fucking love that dude's art. There's an accent mark in his and name, so... It's Grandpa. And Mateus Lopez. Nice. Um, so, mm, mm -hmm. It's a limited series, 18 plus. Uh, available just in time for Batman Day. Uh, oh. It's a twisted version of both the Dark Knight and the City of Gotham. To life in a tale that reaches its key black tendrils and deepest darkest corners. Okay, so the, from 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 this pi from this little pitch, it seems like it's an Elseworlds. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, because uh, Batman makes the decisive choice to kill off Bruce Wayne identity for good and embrace the cape and cow full time. You know what I don't understand about Black Label on a like real quick tangent. Like, I get that Black Label is supposed to be, like, your 17-plus, like, replacement for Vertigo kind of thing. But, like, if you're going to do mostly Elseworlds series on Black Label, why don't you just call the label Elseworlds? Yeah, I don't know. But, so the main main story is going to be about a serial killer who has a surprising connection to Batman. Okay. And then also feature all new... Rose Gallery of utterly depraved villains beginning to emerge from the depths of the city. That's always interesting. Yep. Mm hmm. All right. So, yeah, Tony, you were, you were going to lead us into the last one? 
Yeah. Fucking Johnny Cage. Cage. Yeah, Fucking... man. Oh, Cage, the dude. biggest surprise. They're going full camp, and I'm here for it. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. like, during uh, the watcher of the trailer, it's like, is this Miami Vice mixed with fucking Kung Fu exploitation film slash Mortal Kombat? Pretty much. And the answer is yes. <laughs> also, he fights a lady that looked a lot like Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah. That, oh but, uh, my god. Fantastic. I love that when he, when he starts doing the, uh, the Mortal Kombat shit, he's like, holy Shit. Wait, was what I supposed I just to do? fucking do that? I just, I just spin kicked her fucking head off. Yep. Oh, uh, man. Girl. that that like I I love that it feels like a cheesy '80s action flick. Like, and it's Johnny fucking Cage. It should feel like super cheesy, full of. I mean, he's <laughs> literally just. Jean Claude Van Damme, but Van Damme didn't want to uh, didn't uh, didn't want to do it, so they had to change his name and put shades yeah, on him yeah. because they already designed his face to look like Jean Claude Van Damme. We yep. Which okay. also you want to talk about camp? Perfect choice for, for voice casting, not just Johnny, because you've got Joel McHale, Jennifer Hale, Gilbert Godfrey, R. I. D. Yeah. Yep. And and also Matt Mercer. Yeah, no, this is good. This is gonna be a fun ass movie. Um, and what one more Matt thing in the animated room uh, before we move on to our next segment? Uh, there, the, uh, the we got the trailer for uh, Fiona and Cake finally, and I'm excited as an Adventure Time fan. You know, Adventure Time was one of those shows that like you know followed me through my high school years and is super important to me. But damn it, man. Why you gotta keep doing my boy Simon like this? He's not the Ice King anymore. Leave him alone. They he like just wants to be happy. Characters. They like abusing characters, Jay. They just do. I know, and it sucks. I feel so sad. There you, there you go in classic uh, YouTube. Leave Simon alone. No, for real. Leave Simon alone. <laughs> Just like Brittany. All right. Leave Simon alone. He doesn't deserve any of this, you jackasses. You know, yeah. Jay, in order for you to sell that bit better, you need to, like, drape your blanket over your fucking head. Oh, man. I, I really don't feel like doing that, but I understand. <laughs> I understand the sentiment. But yeah, those were our thoughts on the trailers. Let us know what you thought about the trailers. In the comments down below and uh, we will feature them in comment corner uh, but we will now move on to our final segment because it is that time once again it is screen time all right so for the folks who are new to the podcast screen time is the segment where we all talk about the different pieces of media we've been consuming in between podcast episodes that can be anything from tv shows to movies to books to comics uh, anime and anything in between so i'll start us off because i really don't have that much to talk about uh one thing that i did check out was the first episode of the Hulu Futurama like continuation. It was good. It was really good. Uh yeah, like it hasn't missed a beat. It doesn't feel like it's trying to be topical, which is really great. It was genuinely funny, which is what I was like really worried about cuz you know when they came back with the movies, they, they kind of, like, lost a step with the comedy until they, you know, did later ones. So, I was a little worried about that. But, I mean, this team has been keeping their comedic, uh, comedic swords sharp because, you know, they've been writing for Disenchantment. Which, man, like, that's a show we covered, like, the first two seasons of, but for some reason just never covered the rest of it. Uh, but... Great show. Great show. I mean, 
personally one of my favorite uh Matt Groening shows. Oh yeah. Uh Futurama is and... still my number one, but Disenchantment has yeah. climbed up to number oh, two. Yeah. Disenchantment Dang. fucking love it. Oh yeah. And I'm angry that I haven't finished the past couple of recent seasons because of... Oh yeah, it's good shit. They we they really dive into lore in the recent seasons. Oh yeah, and season two I really enjoyed. And it, God damn it. it. Just some of the things in season three just made me think God damn it. No, Why I did you have on that one? Uh, that. But the uh, the other thing that I, I checked out, which uh, is also uh, animated and, uh, like, pretty fucking awesome. I, I watched it in theaters, and I think I briefly touched on it on one of the first screen time segments we did. So I'm not going to, like, repeat myself too much. But uh, I will say my claim in that first screen time segment still holds up. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish is the best animated movie that came out this year. Because, my God, was it amazing. You know... It technically came out last year. I mean, yeah. you know you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Like, within recent memory. Uh, but, like, man... Uh, I didn't actually mention this in the first screen time segment, so I'll mention it here. Like, dude... Uh, I went to see it with my family, and, like, it was a couple weeks after the movie had aired, like, or initially premiered, so there was, like, we basically had the theater to ourselves, and I was sitting there, like, eating, like, eating my, eating my pizza and my breadsticks, having an emotional breakdown because of a cat's emotional breakdown and a good boy helping said cat out. Yeah. Oh, oh my man. God. Like the portrayal of the the, the mental uh, the mental health like issues that Puss goes through, it was it was too real. It was too real. I like, dude. I was like, I was straight up bawling watching this movie in the theaters, and I almost cried again watching it by myself on Netflix. Uh yeah, uh, I, I, it it just it seems like I'm much more emotionally vulnerable as as an adult than I was as a child, because um, I didn't really cry much as a kid. Um, uh, but, Honest, damn, I feel more fucking pain. Well, I was well, I felt four puss because I actually watched it too, and I was, <laughs> goddamn. I needed something to help me relax after, you know, getting home, trying to, like, space things out. Not throw you into existential crisis. Yeah, and I was like, well, it wasn't too much of an existential crisis for me. But I was like, well, God damn it! I don't want to have, like, this fun cat Listen, character. Listen, that, that, that's the perfect way to, ex- like, to explain puss. Like... We kind of ruined it for Brian because, like, Brian has now heard us gush about it. But, like, the coolest thing is going in to see Puss in Boots, expecting it to be a boring, soulless cash grab. And it turns out to be, like, the greatest movie in a while that I've seen in theaters that, like, literally made me fucking burst into tears. Uh. Now... I do have to ask, though, because you made that blanket statement. Better than a s- crossed? I'd say so. Because it doesn't bullshit me with a cliffhanger. when Just when things are really starting to get good. Yeah. It, had, know, a, it, it, had, it had a complete story from beginning to end. And very tight pacing. So, yeah, I'll say it's better than a cross. Uh, uh, okay. Just and it has one of the one of the greatest animated villains I've seen this side of Disney. Disney needs to take fucking notes. Actually, DreamWorks has done amazing. Oh, I know. I know well, DreamWorks has done amazing villains, but I'm saying, like, you know, like our conversation from the last episode, like Disney has really abandoned the uh, like the iconic villains that they're known for. 
And mm -hmm. man, DreamWorks has really picked up the like picked up the ball in this area because like, yo, the villain in Puss in Boots, and I'm not talking about the main antagonist who is kind of like jokey, who he's still pretty good. He's hilarious, but like the actual like main villain for Puss is oh, phenomenal. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Because it's a villain that's going to come for all of us. Yep. I am not going to spoil not going to spoil it at all because man, it's obvious, but like actually seeing it play out was like amazing. I've also figured out how to do that whistle just to fuck oh. with people. <laughs> so, yeah. Love Puss in Boots the Last Wish. I'll probably go watch it again sometime soon because it it's just that fucking good, man. You know, support and, your favorite fearless hero. Yep, and also you for me personally, I really enjoy just a story about someone who had a moment of crisis, ran away just to hide. And then a random plucky individual brings them back to make them feel more complete and whole again. Yeah, it's your it's your classic like Western story of like the grizzled retired cowboy gets gets plucked out of retirement to save this you know goofy kid. Mm hmm. It's but like <laughs> instead of like a grizzled old cowboy you have a cat you, yeah you have you you have an old fat cat swordsman who uh does not want to befriend the talking annoying dog who which by by the way poor fucking betty though jesus christ you talk about sad that sad but yeah, god damn it if, I, if if there was like if you needed an example of a Brian character, Berito is one there. million percent a Brian character. Brian, I need to tell you this. Like, and I, we mentioned this before in last week's episode. We needed you the most, and you brought us back from our tipping points. Yep. That, that, exactly. and and that's okay. what Perito is for puss it's it's fucking yeah. phenomenal brian look i, I don't normally what? demand you to watch things for screen time but i'm gonna make an exception here i need you to go watch puss in boots the last witch so i can hear your thoughts about it and i second his sentiment entirely brian i am begging nigh i am pleading you please well watch this movie please i did at least this time watch something else that you had been telling me to watch okay okay go ahead brian all right so um i finally uh i don't know why but back when i started invincible i stopped watching for some reason i think life got in the way and then one or two things you never finished kept it? forgetting about it Oh man! No, I watch. I watched like half of it. I uh, I stopped at the Mars episode. Oh, so you you all you've only seen you've only seen the Think Mark scene through clips and memes. No, it, well, up until recently. Okay. Uh, I just watched it like this last week. Yeah. Okay. Really good, like you guys were saying, and uh, boy, does it get brutal! Oh, fuck yeah! Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. and not even yeah. just with the no, final fight, the emotional but... damage. Omni Man savagery knows no limits. Yep, he is a, he is a western animated character who has fucking black air force activity mm -hmm. going. Listen, that's why he joined the round table. Omni Man is a hundred percent Black Air Force energy. Yeah, but... he he represents 
us here in the West when it comes to Black Air Force activity in the animated department. Like you know? normal, like normally, I shit on the evil Superman trope, mm-hmm. but like I actually like Omni Man. He basically said, "I should have put you in a tissue." Yep. Yeah. When you have your but, own dad tell you that, oh that, man, that, that, that's yeah. something. Now, uh, now you understand the but meme also, where like you have Mark's mm-hmm. mom, you have Mark's mom in the car, and there's the sign on the window that says, "Don't worry, the, uh, the, uh, my own my owner uh, my owner just went to go get groceries. Uh, the AC is on, my and my favorite music is playing." Mm. It, it, oh but, my uh, god really but not even so... just the brutality of that but also uh the brutality of uh beast man or whatever his name was oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. i i forget what the, the guy's name is but the the, 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 the motherfucker... lion dude yeah the, the motherfucker yeah. uh the, the motherfucker who like strong armed the twins into working with him yeah, well, no, battle. no. Yeah, Battle Beast, Battle Beast. There it is. Yeah, uh, he didn't do that. Watch everybody uh, in during that one. Sh- uh, no. Yeah, he well, just he just wrecked shit. Um, and k- yeah. almost killed uh, the Guardians Volume Two. Yeah, Guardians Volume Two. Yeah, he just came in, burst in the scene. Absolutely mollywopped and destroyed fucking uh, Cyborg's voice actor, uh, Monster Girl. Black Sam. Man, Sam. Monster, Monster Girl just has such a sad life, yo. Yeah, yeah. and only gets fucking nuttier and worse. Oh, yeah. Oof. Uh, Oof. But, uh, Robot, he was the one who uh, strong-armed the twins. Ah, right, right, robot, fucking robot. Well, because he wanted the, he wanted their cloning technology mm-hmm. well, uh, to build them a new body. Yeah, the the le- the least we talk, well, the less we talk about that jackass, the better for my own mental health. Are you talking Just... about Rexplode? No, I'm talking about robot. Oh yeah, robot. I hate that. True. Oh man. man. Also, petty, petty, like, yeah. I'm also like the whole like duplicate situation. Oh God! Oh. I'm not gonna lie; it was fucked up, but it was also hilarious, bro, bro. Mm. An experiment, I think you try. Oh, a hundred thousand percent. Yeah, yeah, but I wouldn't do so, it like oh. involving the cheating part, but like. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. and also, can we say first ever time that there's? I think it's the first time where I hated a Fred Tattashire character. Which Fred Tattashire? Well, wait, which Fred Tattashire character? He voiced a couple like background people too. Uh, Eve's mom. Uh, Eve's dad. He was what? Eve's dad. Oh. oh. Oh, yeah. Not a big fan of him. Yeah, or mom either. Which They're um, cool. speaking about Eve, did y'all know that they released an Eve special? Oh, did they? I saw a thumbnail of that, and I kind of figured that you were going to bring this up, Brian. It it was an hour long special um that they released like just. Like during Comic Con. Huh. I fucking and, love uh, Eve. Like, dude. Hmm. I watched her. Uh, I watched the special. Uh huh. It's really good. It's a uh, kind of like Eve's story, like her origin stuff. Okay. All right. And uh, she's the main character of. It, and it follows her. Cool. And uh, basically, it's got everything that you'd expect from that universe story. Like, 
Look, man. It's Eve... funny. There's a lot of good action. There's a lot of violence. And there's a good helping of family trauma. Yeah, of course. Like, if you're unfamiliar with Eve, with Eve's backstory, duh. Um, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, like, Eve was always one of my favorite characters from Invincible. I mean, she's a mashup of all of my favorites. She's Jean Grey. She's fucking Sue Storm. She's Wanda Maximoff. All wrapped up into one. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, Eve is fucking awesome. I would also, give her another um, compliment, but that's a huge spoiler. Uh -huh. Also, um, very minor spoiler, though. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, the uh, Invincible, she talks about uh, encountering the. Uh, the Lizard Squad, whatever they're called. Oh, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. That universe is like Serpent. Inside yeah, they're Serpent way. Society, yeah. yeah. The Lizard Legion. Yeah, the Lizard Legion. We actually do get to see some of them. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, voicing their leader, Tatiana Maslany. Oh, cool. I love Tatiana yeah. Maslany. Hopefully mm -hmm. they give you a fair and, uh, shake later on in Marvel. Yep. Um, cause I like the character, but not the execution way they used her. Yeah. Ugh. But but anyway, I also watched, and I thought about it, and I can say this even with our behind the scenes talk. But I watched the movie. Uh, they clone Tyrone. Mm hmm. Which we reacted really to like, on the podcast. Yep. Yep, which uh, the trailer was perfect. It showed you just enough. It's really, it's really weird, but really good. And hit some heavy notes that I would have said, if not for our behind the scenes talk. But I did really like it. And John Boyega knocks it out of the park. Good. Good. It, he yeah. deserves better. Star Wars did for, him fucking dirty. For uh, for those that don't know, um, the story is about a drug dealer, a pimp, and a wannabe ex ho mm. who stumble into a conspiracy that is much bigger than themselves. That's all I will say. Yep. But I really liked it. And uh, I hope to talk about it more someday, maybe. Maybe someday soon, depending on how things roll. But uh, that's just a little hint for y'all at home. But anyway, uh, say more would be to spoil it. It uh, has elements of some of my favorite films, but to say which ones would be spoilers, I realized. So. Cool, I'll cool, just cool. That. Um, All right. Well, that but, wraps uh, up screen time. Tune in next week where we hear Brian thoughts on Puss in Boots: The Last Wish. He better. And see if Brian also cried like a little baby, because we can actually mention what the moment is once he actually mm -hmm. sees it. Mm hmm. Oh man, it wrecked me. It wrecked me emotionally twice. Uh. <laughs> It was major emotional damage. Oh, 100%. 100,000%. But speaking of family trauma, emotional damage, and badass fearless heroes, let's go ahead and talk about American-born Chinese. This is our spoiler-free section, so no worries, folks at home who haven't watched the show yet. We're just going to talk about our initial thoughts and, you know, what we liked about the show uh, overall. So, Tony, we'll start with you. Really enjoyed this show, but due to uh, a lot of life circumstances, wasn't able to finish it. I'm only a couple episodes behind, which are major the, the major discussion points, which I'm sorry, folks. Life just gets in the way. But I really enjoyed what I saw. One of my favorite things about it is 
how a story like this is weaved. Just telling a unique coming in of coming of age story for just two different teenage boys. Different walks of life, but come together in this weird, fun, mystical adventure. Dun, 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 dun. And also, learning how, at least from what I saw, learning from the sins of the past to make a better future. At least try to. But overall, one of my favorite episodes is the flashback episode with uh, Sun Wukong and the big bad of the story. Just fantastic. Really enjoyed that. Yeah, the good shit. Good shit. Champions loved it. Ah, oh, man. So, Brian, what were your initial thoughts since actually you were the first one to finish up this show? Yeah. So once again, very much like to... how I met your father, uh, he got to uh, Brian got to feel the brunt of all my venting as mm-hmm. I watched it earlier well, today as of recording this uh, podcast. Honest, honestly, part of why I watch it is to experience it. Watch it earlier is to experience that, but also just so that I don't ever like waiting for the last minute to watch it because. We had a couple in like previous versions where that happened and it didn't go so well. Uh, lost in space. Rip lost in space. <laughs> yeah. But that one we recorded like two hours later because I. Oh man. Good but times. anyway, Good times. long story. But anyway, um, I really enjoyed it. It was really cool because uh, this is a story that you do see a lot nowadays. But- you rarely see it animated, nonetheless, not animated, uh, not animated, and you rarely see it like for the Western audience. Mm. And I think the way that they handled it was really cool and really good. I really enjoyed it. There were some downsides to it, like spoilers, but also uh, just. The pacing, at least in the beginning, was kind of slow. Yeah, but but the action was the action was done very well Balls and very well to choreographed. The wall, like, uh huh. Love love to see the return of Wire Fu. Seriously. Yeah. And but I mean, you have to have Wire Fu if you have the Queen of Wire Fu in your fucking cast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Michelle Yao and Don Yin. Yeah. Oh my god. Perfect casting straight up. Mm-hmm. For both. Because honestly, like, you know, I mentioned it when we uh we watched the uh like Monkey King animated series trailer for Netflix. I uh and you know, we saw like the, uh, you know a bit of the voice cast. I was like, yo. They should get Michelle Yao to voice uh, Gui Yun. Or, or uh, Guan Yin. Guan, Guan Yin. Yin. Uh, that's how you pronounce it. Guan Yin. I apologize. They should get Michelle Yao to voice uh, Guan Yin. That's who I always imagine whenever I like picture Guan Yin in my head. And then, lo and behold, like I came into this show mm-hmm. like completely blind aside from the trailer. Like I knew she was in it. But I didn't know who she was. All I knew was this show focused around Chinese mythology. So I knew Wukong was going to show up somewhere. But then, like, she shows up as Guan Yin. And I'm like, oh, she's Guan Yin. Yay. Yep. Also, uh, speaking about people uh, and who they play, I was definitely surprised when uh, Kei Hu Kwan, who he was playing. Oh, yeah. Short round. Yep. Uh, yeah, because that really came out of left field for me, but was perfect. Yeah, it, was a, it uh, was a nice meta commentary that ended up tying in. Mm hmm. Like, I really, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, he, he gave a great performance. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Also, uh, Donnie Yen as like an older, more grizzled, uh, war torn monkey king. Yeah, no, no, it, it's it's fantastic because uh, you know, Wukong's story like always focuses on the brash, annoying, like high energy, high energy cocky asshole. Wukong, and we never get to actually see what post enlightenment Wukong is like. So it's really cool to actually get a glimpse of post enlightenment Wukong. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I thought that was really dope. And I think it was a nice natural progression for Wukong's character to kind of like go through that phase that we all kind of go through as adults because you know mm -hmm. when you're when you're a teenager and in your like early 20s you have all these like big dreams and lofty ambitions and you know this that and a third but then you get beaten down by life enough to be like well you know i hated this before but now i understand why it's important maybe i maybe i should chill out a little bit also, yeah, uh, speaking you. about uh, beaten down by life, uh, just also a uh, a note to the uh, I think relatively unknowns who played the parents. Yep. Yeah, no, oh, the yeah. parents were fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I love the coming of age story for both uh, you know Wei Chen and Jin Wong. Uh, I'm a sucker for a good coming of age story. Also. You know, big shout out for like really dope Asian representation. I mean, oh, as yeah, to be indeed. expected from this director. Uh, I am not, mm -hmm. you know, of Chinese descent, but you know, as someone of East Asian descent in general, like that was fucking awesome. Uh, like the speech that Short Rounds actor gave uh, in his uh, interview scene that really hit home for me uh especially because you know growing up i always had dreams of becoming an actor so like it really kind of just lit that fire ba back in my belly of you know what i could still do this i've 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 mastered the skills necessary i've got a strong enough personality i should fucking try it yeah. Like, but yeah. So that you know that that definitely like was really inspiring to me personally. So like, kudos that, there and, for sure. Um, and that sentiment that you mentioned, Jake, they go for anything that any person wants to pursue. Like, hey, for example, uh, it's just writing in general has been a passion project for all three of us, yep. and. Yep. We have decided to actually pursue that goal. Well, in my case, I want to just create something that I can be proud of in a lot of things. And I wanted to be able to do that without these guys here. So, yeah, no, for real. Yeah. Like, yeah, I get you for sure. And uh, like, I, like also. There are, there are a lot of cliches in, in the show. It's very predictable, but, like, not in a bad way. I, I, at least I feel like it. Um, yeah, and also, I just want to say that the, that uh, I do appreciate that uh, the bully character wasn't just, like, one note. It was a, it was a very good subversion of expectations. I oh, yeah. I was I was very surprised with how uh, the bully was handled, and also the the conversation in the principal's office super real. We'll we'll talk we'll talk about that more uh, when we get into spoilers and stuff. Oh God, the principal! Uh, wow. But yeah. Oh God. Uh, the little her did not like her. <laughs> oh, so. God. Yeah, let's so let's go let's go ahead and uh, just kind of again keep talking spoiler free. Uh, Wei Chen, awesome character. He reminded me a lot of Monkey, but he was his own he was his own person. Um, and from what I saw, 
kid had a lot of just inner turmoil and self-doubt. Oh, yeah. No, and, like, Ooh. that's Ooh, yeah. just kind of... Like, that's a struggle that a lot of kids have when they come from, like, the household of high-achieving parents, right? Yeah, and like, I... you know, just to, just to use myself as an example, like, you know, um, my mom... She, uh, you know, she worked her way up from the bottom of, uh, you know, of this factory, you know, working as a line worker. And 20 some odd years later, she is now like higher upper management, like base, like almost damn near running an entire department. So, like, you know, my mom has definitely been a in big inspiration for striving to you know striving to reach for more and my pops as well you know my, my pops you know uh got into the navy worked his way up did uh you know you know did his service you know was proud of serving his country and even kind of served it again when he got a job as a you know contractor uh and then so like with both my parents they've set such a strong example that it's a lot to measure up to. And especially as a teenager, fuck, even as an adult, like it's hard to not try to compare yourself and measure up, you know, man, when my parents, my, when my parents were 29, they had this, that, and a third, you know, here I am just sitting in my room editing YouTube videos. Oh yeah. Like, you know, yeah. so I totally yeah. get uh, Wang Chen, uh, like Wei Chen's plight in that regard for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, I also kind of share a lot of uh, not only Wei Chen's uh, like trying to live up to uh, parental expectations because of his uh, esteemed father. But also, also it it's not it, really uh it's not directly mentioned, but I'm pretty sure I can also piece together who his mother is. I had an inkling too, but mm. it's not it's not said in the last two episodes, so it's not a spoiler. But I got I got speculation. I I do too, but I just don't want to like jump the gun. Yeah, yeah. prove it. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll but, talk about it more in the speculation section at the end, folks. Uh, but and, yeah, go ahead, Tony. Continue. But also, I and I know just personally for me, what it's like to try to get your point across, no matter how crazy or eccentric you may come off. I really related to that part of. Wei Chen's character. Mm -hmm. Also, like, uh, not to di yeah. not to discount Jin at all because I related to Jin a lot, and uh, this is gonna make me sound like an old man, but like I, I talked to I talked with my niece about this the other day, right? So, like in her elementary school, like all the kids are talking about like Demon Slayer and stuff. You know, watching anime and reading manga is super cool because, you know, uh, like everybody watches anime nowadays. When I was her age, oh, yeah. you had to hide that shit. You couldn't show up to school with anything outside of a Dragon Ball t-shirt because all the kids liked Dragon Ball. Um, mm -hmm. But like if you were a boy who showed up with a Sailor Moon t-shirt. Oh, it was not going to be a good day for you. You would get fucking clowned to high heaven. And like, oh, you yeah. know, uh, I, I remember th this didn't happen to me in high school, but in middle school, like before the big Avengers boom and the like the, the rise of superhero media being like such a huge force in pop culture. I remember in middle school thinking to myself, like, I want a fresh start. I'm going to not really show people my deep passion and interest for comic books. 
I'm just going to I'm just going to focus on stuff people think is cool. I'm going to just focus on doing music and, you know, uh, other stuff like that, uh, you know, writing. But, you know, I'm not going to really mention comic books outside of with my friends who already know that I'm into this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. so like i related mm -hmm. to i related to um jin a lot with that especially like you know wanting to hide your manga and your comics and stuff like that because you're afraid yeah. of you know people thinking you were weird and not taking you seriously and you know all this other stuff especially because you're already different from a lot of people on the outset so I like oh. especially got that and related to Jin in that regard as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. As someone with disability, yeah, I understand that part too. Mm -hmm. uh, hey. actually, um I had a group of friends, but it was just four of us. And we were like heavily into Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh man. Talk about it anywhere else you get Oh yeah, no, uh, like, I, like, I, I was in the competitive scene in high school, but I never mentioned it to anybody. Never mentioned it to anybody, never brought a deck anywhere outside of locals. Because I did not want to be clowned as, you know, that freshman who still plays Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh, man. Yeah, I had a yep. few moments like that myself in high school actually and to be honest i <laughs> i just made the butt of a few jokes i'll be honest yeah i'm sure no oh, yeah i think we all have yeah for sure and, well not as bad as you know viral video worthy well Thankfully, uh, when we were, uh, when all three of us were in high school, again, not to make us sound old, when all three of us were in high school, memes were only just starting to be a thing. Oh, yeah, definitely. And because, like, you know, we were in high school in the like early to mid boom of inter the internet and social media. Yep. Yeah, uh, just for a frame of reference. Just to give an example, my graduating year was 2010. So, just to give you folks an idea. Class of 2012, baby! Oh. Fuck yeah. Still mad proud of that. Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there's a good chunk of difference here, but within the same range. Mm -hmm. And, oh, God. Most of the shit I did was to myself. I, I made, I just leaned in to what everyone perceived me as too much. And the and the thing that I think that is most relatable with Jin that that keeps him from just being generic high school boy protagonist is the mm -hmm. fact that like it's very real, like for him to care so much. Because, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the dumb mistakes I made in high school to try and impress people and stuff was all because I cared way too much about what other people think about me. And, like, as an adult now, I could give less of a fuck. Uh, oh, definitely. But, definitely. you know, as a kid, oh, when yeah. you are really in that stage where you you know, need people to like you and, you know, everybody around you that is like older talks about how, you know, the friends you make in high school will last forever and all this other shit. Um, again, like using my, my mom, my parents as an example, like all my aunties, like my, uh, my, all my aunties who are like my close family friends are all my mom's best friends from high school. And they're such a they're such a you know tight knit close group, and you know they they did the thing where well my, I think my mom and my aunt were the only ones that actually had kids, but like they did the thing where you know kids are close and you know 
lived near each other, all that stuff. And I remember thinking, like, when I first got to high school, like, man, I gotta, I gotta get like that. I have to find friends like that. And oh, yeah. because of that, I really kind of, like, pushed to the side, at least in the beginning, the friends that I did have that were like that. I focused so hard on making new friends that, like, I ignored friends. some of my, like, actual, like, ride or die best friends. And it, you know, I've apologized to them for it, and they, they understood, but, like, you know... Again, looking back at an adult is a whole different thing. Like, don't get me wrong, oh, I yeah. made some, I made some great friends in high school, but I haven't talked to a good majority of them since graduation. Oh, dude, totally. Especially me, which is kind of ironic because I was so worried because of what really definitely affected me in high school is my senior year right before my senior year we moved ah oh, that's rough so, yeah. i i had to spend my senior year at a completely new school completely new people so yeah and even the friends that i did have it was like i wanted them to like me so much that i uh let them uh Push me around. Yeah. Yes, man. You? I uh, don't. <gasps> Dude, that's kind of where I learned it. I am shocked and appalled. Not Brian. Uh, I, 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 I need to find my Audio people, couch you can't see me awful. clutching my invisible pearls, but I am clutching my invisible pearls. Well, dude, that's kind of where it started. I know. <gasps> Hence yeah. the overly dramatic, sarcastic tone. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the, the the first podcast that I hosted was a video games podcast. Oh, Me yeah. hosting a video games podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. One thing that I can also kind of relate to, not so much now. But back then, during my high school days, mm -hmm. I can recall very well that no one really had my back for the most part. No, like, I was always made the butt of people's jokes. Uh -huh. And no one was like, hey, don't treat him like that. But one distinct memory I can recall is when my mom was telling this story to me where she was stopping by my high school and a couple people were like, oh, that Tony guy, he's just weird, ain't he? Just paraphrasing here. Yeah, he's just too odd. And my mom, being the mama bear that she is, just basically said, hey, don't talk to about him like that. And these uh, kids were like, oh, yeah, it was Mary. It's like, I'm his mom. It's like, oh. <laughs> Your mom has more restraint than my mom. If my mom heard people talking shit about me, she would have bopped those, ki bopped those kids right in the mouth. I don't know if she'd get physical, but she would, my mom would definitely get in there and... My mom would, my mom would not her. give a fuck about hitting other people's kids if it talk if it means like they're talking shit about her kids. Uh, well, my mom already proved that she was a mom bear enough to uh, protect me when I was very young from uh, one of the more traumatic experiences in my life in my formative years. This is not the How I Met Your Father episode. We can't go. We're not going into here again. I do not want to be here for five hours. Point being, my mom did stood up for me when I when I needed it. Which correlating to what happened with Jin in the viral video, he was trying to like not do damage control, but damage control. It's like, hey, it's all cool. It was just a joke. It's fine. So it just 
seeing that scene made me remember. Oh, oh yeah. High school days were the fucking nuttiest, man. Yeah, like my uh-huh. high school, my high school experience wasn't terrible, but like, because my 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 low point in my school years was middle school, like middle middle school, like yo. Kids are really fucking mean in middle school because like you're in that weird in between where you're you know not a kid per se but you're not quite a teenager so like you're trying to impersonate a teenager while still having the mentality of a kid so you're just kind of mm-hmm. fucked up which uh we don't really want to get into like stories and all but middle school yeah that's the one time where i kind of got into a pseudo fight basically a girl beat me up same age as me yep uh i've mentioned that story to these guys off camera before but yeah uh, point being like you know this uh, yeah. like Jin's story could have very easily just been generic boy high school problems but they felt authentic and real so like Mm -hmm. you know kudos to the actor for his performance as well as the you know the writers behind the show as well Mm -hmm. to reiterate one of our Mm -hmm. points from last week's behemoth of an episode this is exactly Mm -hmm. why writers are important people you wouldn't Mm -hmm. be able to have such genuine moments without having real people who have experienced these moments to, you know, pen the script. And you know why you should, uh, you know, pay them? Mm Mm-hmm. Also pointing out that these two kids fight like actual teenagers and just, when they have a falling out, it's like, I can't get mad at them for the way they handled things because they're teenagers. Yeah, but I, can I mean, all... like, dude, I've had I've had falling <laughs> out with some of my best friends over the dumbest shit. Looking back at it, uh, looking back at it as an adult, but like as a kid, your world is so small that like the tiniest shit is like world ending for you. Yeah, and. uh uh, so, I mean, even with like actual end of the world shenanigans happening in the show. Yep. From, I mean, granted, I haven't seen the last two, so I don't, I can't say that for sure. No, you are correct. But, end of the world shenanigans happen. Uh, but my point is, when you have two characters that have a difference of opinion, one trying to complete a grand quest and the other trying to just figure himself out as teenagers want to do, and that creates great conflict. And, I mean, not to be corny, but, like, you know, a big theme of this show is that, like, life and figuring out who you are is a grand quest in itself. Yeah, I mean, isn't it what the initial uh, story of Journey to the West was. It yeah. was a look into the innermost points of enlightenment and into humanity as a whole. Exactly. Like, um, And I think that's what makes this show so good, is that like, it touches on the same themes of Journey to the West, of self-discovery and introspection, without just being, all right, now it's uh, Wei Chen's turn to go through what Monkey went through. Uh, Like, you know, Wei Chen made a point very early on, like, you know, I'm not you and I don't want to be you. Yeah, things are not one for one like they were in Journey to the West. Mm -hmm. Uh... This story is wholly beholden to just our two leading characters. Yep. Just figuring shit out as they go. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's what, what we all do. And, again, that's why that's what makes this shit so relatable. And, you know, why I personally enjoyed it so much. Oh, so did I. 
All right. Well, so folks, I. as much as we love having our boy Tony here, uh, it is time for him to take his bow and exit podcast left because we're about yep. to talk spoilers. But I should also just give my score beforehand. Yeah, yeah. So, so just based on what I've seen and probably will change, subject to change it after I see the last two, I give this show a solid eight, in my honest opinion. Okay. Just a solid eight. Really enjoyed a lot of the things, like the character dynamics, the family drama, the the villain I really like. Mm-hmm. Just, I like his motivation. That's all I'm going to say about that. And if uh, things change after the last two, I can easily just amend them after talking to the guys. Yep. And he can he can update you next week if he manages to finish next week, I guess as part of screen time or something. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, as always, it's a pleasure having you on, Tony. We will hopefully see you next week. Folks at home, yeah. say goodbye to Tony. All right. Later, everyone. All right. Peace. Later. All right, folks. So, with all, all right. that preamble out of the way, Brian can now take <laughs> off push to talk because there are, you know, not more than uh, th- th- uh, two of us. And we can begin our spoiler discussion of American Born Chinese Season 1. So if you have not seen all eight episodes available on Disney+, Plus, do yourself a favor, watch this show. It's fantastic. You know, both of us highly recommend it. So, giving you guys your usual customary countdown to get on out of here, watch the show, and then come back. The video will be here waiting for you when you do return, or the podcast will be waiting for you in your respective feeds for when you return. So, we'll just count you off. Five, four, three, two, one. Now that the spoiler-free people are gone, and now that Tony is gone, oh, oh shit. It's funny that Tony said it, that. Right? About the villain. Yeah. I, yeah, so are you going to say what I'm going to say? Because if you're going to say what I'm going to say, I'll let you say it. Because in the last two, he does kind of... Yeah, he devolves into one no bad guy out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like he has he, so much nuance built up, and then by the end, built up, and then by the end, it's just yeah, I will destroy the world. I don't care that you apologize. Yeah, yeah, like look, I'm not saying I wanted him to be redeemed and to like surrender. He could still want to destroy the world. But, like, after he gets defeated, I was, like, hoping for a moment where it's like, you know what, Wukong? Apology accepted. But no! Mm-hmm. He was just a bitch the whole time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like, um. I, but I did like him prior to those last two episodes. Oh, yeah, and, uh, He's definitely different than, uh, what was his name? Kyle? Yep. Or whatever, the bully. Oh, you're talking about, uh, Greg? Yeah, Greg. Greg was the one who actually did the meme. Travis was the one who Jin thought did the meme, but actually didn't. Well, I was specifically talking about Travis, because... At the end, though, he's like, yeah, go! So, like, again, we, we, we alluded to this earlier, but now we can fully talk about it. I love that, you know, this show, with how much it embraces tropes, they could have easily mm-hmm. embraced the tropes of the bullies not being your real friends and them all being fake jackasses and... Just taking advantage mm-hmm. of Jin. But, like, honestly, they were all good guys. Like, 
At first, I thought Greg was being disingenuous and only w wanted to apologize to Jin because he would miss out on games. Mm -hmm. But, like, after you see them interact once Jin is on the team, no, they're just genuinely friends. It also doesn't help that uh, whoever they got to play him visually remind you of a certain infamous brothers. Yeah, okay. I'm glad you saw it because I was thinking this too. I was like, wait, did we find the missing Paul brother? Did we find Lake? Did we find Lake Paul? Oh, but yeah, no. Uh, like, all the soccer bros were great. And, like, the fact that, like, the chump run was something that all the newbies had to do and they were genuinely impressed by Jin and, like, you know, he became mm. big man on campus because, you know, he went ham. That, that was great. And like you said, I loved, like, how into the cosplay performance the boys got because their homie mm. was in it. And, it, and, you know, they were like, yeah, he's a fourth scroll. Yeah. Damn right, you're the fourth scroll. Even though nobody knows what that means. Yep. But, uh, but yeah, also, I do, I do have to admit that you talk about subverting tropes. They talked about how, uh, great, now that you've done this, uh, like, introduction to us, we're going to use all of that to, uh, manipulate yeah, you, kind of. right? For the, for but the it thing. turns out to just be and harmless fun. They never address the crush. Yep, because they're just like, no, that's run. a di that's a dick move. I thought they were going to, they were going to, like, do some shit, like, you see in every teen show and teen movie where the jocks embarrass the good boy in front of his crush or make him do something stupid in front of his mm -hmm. crush. But no, they were just like, oh man, good for you, dude. Like, you know, dream big. You know, they gave him mm -hmm. shit because that's what your friends do. But like, they didn't mm -hmm. like cock block him. <laughs> And also subverting expectation, though, I do like how um, at first, because in these typical things where you have like the timid hero who's trying to find themselves, usually when they've got the uh, the, uh, the conventional attractive, crush. yeah, that um, at first the girl will say no to hanging out because she has a boyfriend, and. Not only did she not have a boyfriend, but we later find out that under that, like, confident exterior is someone who's equally... As damaged, yeah. Insecure. Because, like, I mean, like, so that's the thing about confident people, right? Co mm -hmm. We're really fucked up inside, probably more so than most, but... The thing about being confident is being aware mm -hmm. of how fucked up you are and just not giving a fuck, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's the key to being confident. I mean, like, Wukong definitely, like, showed that off in his flashback. Um, but, like, I really appreciate Amelia's character because, mm -hmm. you know, again, this show already leaned into a lot of tropes, right? And, you know, they did it in very tasteful and good ways, but they already leaned into a lot of tropes. The, what I was expecting was Amelia was going to be your, uh, for anybody who watched Spectacular Spider-Man, your Liz Allen. You know, the popular girl mm. who's kind of cold to our nerdy hero, but then slowly warms up to them as they are forced to hang out because of school stuff. And then she falls for the hero and forms the best ship ever on that show. Don't at me. Um, but yeah, with Amelia, it's like the thing with her was she did genuinely like Jin, like the hot stuff comment wasn't her like, ha ha. 
like making fun of the dorky kid. That was her cringy bad attempt at flirting. Because, you know, she's mm -hmm. a teenager. And then when that came back, at the birthday I party, thought that was adorable. Oh my god, I felt like I felt like a proud parent. Mm -hmm. uh, and and like the turning point where you find out like, oh, this girl down bad, but just afraid to admit it, is the killer birthday party that she. Did. Yo, she went. And that party was lit, <laughs> and she did that on like one day's notice. That party was lit, if not a little oh, racist, yeah. but not her fault. His friends didn't realize that that was low-key racist to order a bunch of Panda Express. Well, see, here's the thing, though, is they ordered the Panda Express for them. I know. Didn't save him any. Yeah. Oh man, that shit. That shit was hilarious. <laughs> Like yes, they didn't, they, they themselves never even realized how low key racist that was. <laughs> but mm -hmm. Jin, being the good guy that he is, and knowing that you know these dudes are harmless and you know don't really have a mean bone in their bodies, just like I don't know, they I guess they just genuinely like Panda Express. Oh yeah. Uh, and then uh, Wei Wei Chin is also at the party, and he's just like. Yay, I got one! Yeah, oh man, like, how, he, like, I love, I love that, like, again, the subversion of the trope, because, you know, the kids were all making fun of Wei Chen at first, because of, you know, weird, kooky, mm -hmm. weird foreign kid! Haha, <laughs> isn't he funny for misunderstanding Americanisms? Uh, but like when he actually starts to hang with the hang with uh, you know Jin's friends, like everybody loves him because he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, it's it's fucking awesome. I love that these kids aren't just your high school trope kids. Yeah, like the like the best friend who they had a falling out. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh no, that's going to be like a whole hate them. Maybe yeah, even works I, for the like, villain. I thought, at I thought the they end. were going to go the, the annoying route of, you know, since the, the old best friend has patched things up with the hero. Now the old, now the old best friend is jealous of the new best friend. They're not going to get along for a bit until they realize they have common ground. Nah, Nuge loved Wei Chen from the jump. Oh yeah. So like, you Nuge know, just uh, just uh, hated that that they had a falling out. Yeah. That uh, his friend didn't defend him. And when I mean, he was getting bullied. Like I don't know, I don't know about you, Brian, but like I know back in my high school days, I definitely had like similar experiences. Not the like, not defending my friend kind of thing, but like a uh, like. You had you had a falling out with your friend, but night but both of you are so stubborn that neither of you wants to talk about it or apologize because if you do, you feel like less of a man, and so you're just kind of sitting there huffing at each other while your other friends are like, "Will you guys just hug already?" No, I never had that because I never had. I hate to say it, but I never had friends long enough for that because we kept moving. Oh man, sorry about that. And then, and well, also it was in the military community, which means that that my friends were also like moving. Yeah, yeah. Um, like what... I had, to, I had for a bit when I was like, when I was about, I think it was like ten, eleven, twelve. I had a very close knit of a uh, of a. Uh, People that included a really good friend and a maybe girlfriend. Because, you know, back when you're that young, you're kind yeah, of a it, little bit of You don't really know what a girlfriend is at 11, 12. But we were holding hands and I was oh, going to play oh, out dang, at I, her house. I'm going to have to censor that in the edit. What? 
Damn, fast ass right. young Brian over here. Committing the greatest but, of cardinal yeah, sins. Um But yeah, beyond that though, I I do get what you're talking about. I know that mentality. Mm -hmm. Just that was never me. But oh yeah, no. Nah. Like, it was well it was well done here and uh Yeah. Also, like going back to Amelia real quick, I love the mm -hmm. other subversion they do with her, where like it's not the shy, stammering nerd hero that is scared to admit their feelings. No, he was up front at the start. It was her. And then she mm -hmm. like gathers the courage to come up to him. And it's like, you know, you know, I said at the beginning of the year that we could hang out and, you know, just be buds. Well, I don't want to be buds. That was so it was so cute and earnest. What the hell just happened? Oh, what happened? All of a sudden. Oh, for a brief time there, my light just went like an overexposure. Oh, shit. But yeah, like that oh, moment was so cute enough. and earnest. I was just like, yeah. oh my goodness, you adorable little child. They did. And uh, you talking about like them, like leaning into some cliches and subverting some. It was cute where he was like, I gotta still save the world, basically. He didn't say it, but... Yeah, yeah. He, 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 he walks like, off, and she's sad because she thinks he... Like, you know, they just had this moment, and he's, and he's standing her up now. And then he, he just immediately runs back, gives her a kiss, and then, you know... The one cliche. Goes back. Look, some cliches are cliches yeah. for a reason, because they're great mm -hmm. moments. I did not give a fuck in that moment how corny and cliche that was. I was cheering for those kids. Also, it was our boy standing up and actually, like, being like, screw this. Making the first move, taking Wei Chen's advice, mm -hmm. and being a confident dude. Which also, by the way, just side note, I loved it at the end where dude was like, big night, huh? Dude, you kissed that, me. That was my that was my favorite that was my favorite line ever. <laughs> in the car, and it's just like, man, crazy night, right? It's like, and then you know, uh, fucking Jin is like, yeah, man. They're like, we fought a demon, we saw the Monkey King, all this shit. No, no, no. well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't, be I still can't believe you kissed Amelia. Oh man, that's such a that's like that's such a friend thing. I could see any of like my mm -hmm. close friends doing that shit to me. Like, mm -hmm. but also it was a genuine moment. From oh yeah, a no, for real, for real. Um, okay, so I want to go into one of my other negatives. Uh, for for this uh for the show. Um, yeah, I feel like it's not as prevalent as uh, the examples I'm going to mention. But mm -hmm. I feel like this show slightly suffers from what I like to call the MCU problem. Mm -hmm. And, or more specifically, the Taika Waititi Thor problem. Mm -hmm. They, so... One of my biggest issues with Ragnarok, despite liking the movie, right? I really like the movie. But mm -hmm. I feel like, and I still hold this opinion, I feel like the jokes, especially at the end, really undercut how serious and somber, like, the actual events going on on screen are happening. And, like... You know, this was a big case for uh, Love and Thunder with the Jane subplot. The Jane subplot was, like, dire and super serious, but all they did was joke about it. And I was like, dude, the woman he loves is dying. This is not the time to make uh, a joke. I never saw. 
I never saw Ragnarok. Well, you know from the comics about Jane's cancer plots, though. Like that's well, not no a... Love and Thunder. Yeah, I saw Ragnarok. I didn't. See yeah, Love but I'm and saying Thunder. you you know you know about you know from the comics about Jane's yeah. cancer plot, so that's not really a thing. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But yeah, like again, uh, this movie doesn't suffer from that problem as much, but I think it definitely had moments where it did, especially the ending cliffhanger. Like, I like the cliffhanger. Oh. I like the cliffhanger. It was a really, really oh. good cliffhanger. If they had just cut it right there. Because... But they had to do the... Uh, he doesn't know it was Chinese. the Marvel... It was the Marvel thing. thing. You remember when we talked about, um, like, Werewolf by Night with, uh, with Cap? In the one episode we did mm. for the podcast? It was that same problem of, like... This would have been perfect if you cut it off before you made the extra joke. Mm -hmm. Like Man Thing and Man Thing and Werewolf by Night getting sushi, hilarious. Take keep that. But then you do another joke at the end with Elsa Bloodstone, and it's like, all right, this isn't funny. This kind of just makes her seem like a bitch. Yeah, I I hear you. I I totally get you. Um, which, uh, that reoccurring joke, um, I'm not second generation, I'm not anyone of color, so I wouldn't know from experience, but it did seem overused. Oh, you talking about the, you talking about the one with the, like, the full house gag? No, the, the hint, Jen doesn't know Chinese. Oh. Well, that's just kind of a common joke and trope of second generation immigrant immigrant children. I, so, like that yeah. was that was funny and relatable. Like I didn't find that joke like to be annoying. Well, that was the that was the end joke. Well, well, like I found it to be annoying in the moment of the cliffhanger, but like overall uh, when it was I used, I didn't find it to be annoying. I get what you mean. Uh, yeah, I can understand. I my, can understand that. My there other one issue, too many jokes. like the one running gag that I think did go on for too long, um, yeah. was the way Chen doesn't understand America. Oh yeah. Like, it was funny for a little bit, but mm -hmm. then it just it just got sad. Because it was like, because it was like, dude, at this point, you're not even trying to learn about America and not embarrass your friend. You're just, you're just doing it to cause tension, to like artificially create tension between you and Jin. You already know this shit makes him uncomfortable. Why are you doing it still? Oh, yeah. And also, uh. I appreciate the callback and everything going full circle, but the whole him regifting the powder, but it's supercharged. Yep, that that seems a little off. I get what he was trying to do, and also it did help like save his father in the end. Yeah, but still, and the weird thing is though, is this. This same show has a few reoccurring jokes that are hilarious. That are... Like yes, my, like fav Michelle my favorite, favorite the joke, my favorite joke is my favorite recurring joke is uh, Guan Yin, like loving America, like like you know going to the yeah. Chinese buffet, and my favorite line ever delivered by Michelle Yao. Uh, like you know, I have stopped. I've stopped great calamities. You know, negotiated treaties between demons and beasts. I will not be defeated by Swedish furniture. Which you know, as somebody yeah, who's that... tried to assemble an IKEA desk, I feel you, Guan Yin. That reoccurring joke with the coffee table was great. I love it. At that the was end fucking she's like, hilarious. I'm do you think anyone in, in heaven? Do you think ever, anyone in heaven would like this coffee table? You know what? Don't answer that. We're taking it anyway. <laughs> yeah, because she was so proud of it. Yeah, look, I would be proud of it too. 
dude, I don't, I don't know if you yeah. ever had to build an IKEA desk, but that's like a whole week affair. Mm -hmm. Like when I had to, oh, yeah. like when I had to, when I redesigned my room, and we got mm -hmm. like we built the new desk and the like, the, like the new bed frame and all this shit. Like that was like. I, I, there was two whole weeks where I was spending it on the couch downstairs because we were trying to figure out how to assemble this bullshit. Yeah, and also, you want to talk about, like, things that I thought would be annoying? Mm hmm That weren't? Definitely a... Rania Chang... Probably saying that wrong. Oh yeah, Madam Rocky, As the Mad Monk. Ma uh, oh, oh, you, oh, you're talking, you're talking about uh, G Gong, G Gong, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, G Gong was cool. G Gong was cool. He very much reminded me of like Jackie Chan's drunken master, and like, oh yeah, he really redeemed himself in the end. Oh my god, dude, Lei Chin, Chin using the beads. Yep. And he didn't have but, to, and he didn't have to die to redeem himself, which I really appreciate. Yeah, but yeah, uh... but he was all speaking of like good recurring jokes. He was fucking hilarious. The sweet Caroline bit had me dying. Oh yeah, yeah. Which uh, he's actually played by uh, by Ronnie Chang. Uh, uh, stand-up comedian. Oh, nice. Good for you, man. You did great. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, like, you know, there's th there's a lot really good, but there's like some really small, just little nitpicky annoyances. And I mentioned it in the, uh, I mentioned it in, oh shit, he was in Megan. Hmm. But I mentioned in the, the uh, non-spoiler, but, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, the pacing in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Like, it doesn't really start going until episode three. Dude. Dude. The, you have this whole fantastical story that is only eight episodes, yet the main character doesn't get roped into the plot and doesn't figure out, like, the big world... Yeah, around him, until, until the until last three episode. episodes. That yeah, that that pissed me off. Also, the fact that we have this mystical, fantastical world, and we spend like ninety five percent of this show in fucking high school. Mm -hmm. Like, I get it for coming of age reasons and budget reasons, but like, dude, you couldn't have some like cutaways or. You know, flashbacks. Also, also, the minor, another minor thing, is uh, the randomly appearing text crawl at the beginning. Yeah, uh, I get what like, that. I get that's a random. reference to actual Journey to the West. No, no, no. It was cool when it was used, but it just. It randomly showed up in episodes and randomly yeah, didn't it was in inconsistent. Others. Like I wish they would have just kept it as yeah. like a, a thing that happened every episode. Yeah, indeed. It was just weird. Yeah. Um, what other stuff? I so I'm not gonna lie. As good of an actor, as good actors as the parents were, I really didn't need the parent subplot. Like, oh, they were yeah. really, really forcing the, you see the parallel? Woo, uh, mm -hmm. Jin's dad is like the bull demon. Mm -hmm. And Jin's mom is like Wukong. Get it? Get it? Like, the parents are great, and they're utilized very well, and like... The impact they have on Jin mm -hmm. is fantastic. Like the principal's office scene is great, and the, the scene at the karaoke mm -hmm. bar is great. But like, I did not need whole portions of the episode dedicated to fucking Jin's mom slanging herbal powder and like 
Jim, also, Jim's dad um, trying to get the courage to get a promotion at work. Yeah, which um, I like the actors and I like the scene, like as a scene. But the Bon Jovi Bond Fest was not needed. That really just, I was like, why is this, like, a lot of the parent subplot, I just kept saying out loud, why is this here? Also, um, they got a, I forgot his name now, and I'm sorry, but they got a really cool, like, reoccurring character actor in Hollywood. To be the boss, but he only shows up in one episode. Yeah, and like, because seriously though, dude, like, again, the parents are used very well, but if you just use the parents in those important scenes and just have, like, their, like, marriage on the rocks thing be, like, a thing that's happening in the background, mm -hmm. you get the same effect mm -hmm. without wasting time. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't complain about this if this was, like, a 13-episode series, right? But this is eight. Mm -hmm. We don't got time. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I get what they were doing with it, and I get that it was supposed to be cringy on purpose. And, like, and I, like, I get the powder thing came back too... in the plot, like you said, with the whole supercharged yeah. powder thing. Cool. Oh, I was moving on. But, like, you know... Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, I know that, it, I know that it had good payoff with uh, the principal theme, and then also, uh, it was she was reasonably funny in the final fight, but the principal racism got a little too much at times. Yeah, like so, I it felt very it felt too much on the nose. Not, yeah. I, not even necessarily the racism. The thing that pissed me off is that they were so on the nose with the microaggression, see, I'm helping kind yeah. of person. And, like, I get it. It's yeah. real. But, like, this character just, just uh, frustrated me. I, I will admit, though, that... The in true fashion where you've got like um the annoying person and the straight man. Mm -hmm. I did like in the final scene the pairing with her and the the soccer the, coach. Oh man. Yeah. I but I I love her coach. reactions all through this shit. Just like, oh my god, this is yeah. so cool. Way better than last year. How the hell are these kids doing? Like, <laughs> I knew his parents are loaded. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which I'm glad that comes back because, like, they mention it offhandedly when, when like, he gets the Pikachu costume. Yeah, and like, you know, you see his car later, and like, it's a fucking nice ass Jeep. Mm -hmm. But like, I and love I'll that that a... actually like comes into play, like, as the excuse to why all this shit is happening. So cool, all this, all this cool shit is happening. And the coach is like. Can we play soccer now? Yeah, it's like, so uh, and... can we start the game now? And the, the, the principal's like, N -n 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 I don't think they're done. Hold on, I want to see how this ends. And then also, are they flying now? I mean, I guess. Oh, <laughs> uh, that, was, that was so good. Like, mm. like... Other than the principal, I was turned around on all the characters that I disliked. But the principal, man, mm -hmm. like, she did have her really funny moments. But that was not enough to make up for all her bullshit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to see more of thing... Amelia's parents if we get a season two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because... But the funniest thing with the principal was just her bouncing off the coach, which... Yep. You also want to talk about, like, a not cliche. The coach himself. Yeah. He, he was very one note, like, you know, I see potential in you, kid. You gotta work hard and do better. 
do what's best for the team. Yeah. Like, he, Although it yeah, was kind of funny. He was just kind of generic. But the yeah. whole... The whole, uh... Burn... The fire oh, that scene where they destroy the fucking weight room was hilarious. And I love how it ends up helping him. He's like, you know, at first, I was pissed at you. But then we found out that the school actually placed the fire extinguisher in the wrong spot. So that wasn't on you. That was on the district. And because you did that, they are forced to build me a new equipment room. So thank you. And I love it. Jin's like, well, sir, do you I want guess. me to help? Set that? Uh, uh, it's okay. It's, uh, it's okay. I got it. I'll do it myself. Mm -hmm. Like, they use also, humor um, really well in this show, but like... Sometimes they overdid it. Yeah. And, this, for, and, like, and that like annoying. undercut some important scenes. Mm -hmm. I know she was under annoying at the beginning, but I did grow to like uh, the uh, protest chick, too. Oh, dude. Protest chick was hella cringe in the beginning. I mm -hmm. was like, dear God, please don't let this be her entire character. And then they, like, but, the, they did what I wish they did with the parents. They just carted her off to the side, let her do stuff in the background. She ended up developing a thing with Nuge, but there's not a whole ten-minute side plot about her and Nuge dating. But th that was just a fun, good, funny line at the end, where it's like, she's my girlfriend. It's like, what? You said we could say it. He's not my boyfriend. But you said we were dating. Oh, I mean, first date, but we're dating. <laughs> and she's like, just super embarrassed. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, at first I thought she was the chick from Bizarre Vark that was like Olivia Rodrigo's mm -hmm. best friend. But it's not her. I had to Google it. Yeah. I had to Google it. Because she definitely looks familiar. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but yeah, like... They turned me around on her because they toned her down and didn't shove us, shove her in our mm -hmm. faces. Like, mm -hmm. like I said, they did what they should have, they did with her what they should have done with the parents. Leave her shit for yeah. a background plot. Um, mm -hmm. And I get where she's coming from, too. Yeah, and I also, but I also like that she, she didn't push any further after that. She's like, hey, if that's what you want to do. All right, I respect your choice. Like, that is very civil and, you know, reasonable. Mm. Unlike most characters portrayed on TV with the protesting angle. Oh, God. So much cringe. Yep. Uh, oh, man, I was cringing so hard at the, you know, just us starts with us. Or justice starts with just us. Justice starts with just us. Like, uh... you, you want to talk about like me listening to you or me watching your ranting text? So much <laughs> cringe, man. Yeah. But again, they turned her around uh, as a character. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope she's not featured too heavy <laughs> like that's gonna sound so mean but i feel like sh with her with the personality they set up for this character she could get annoying real fast if she stays around for too long well, well also depending on how they want to go with season two she might have a bigger role mm -hmm. because to help search for him but uh but yeah, uh, also, you want to talk about annoying characters that kind of uh, didn't annoy me at the end was uh, the co-stars for uh, Freddy. Oh, yeah. Because I, I like that they were self-aware. They're like, I mean, obviously, homie, it took homie a second to realize it. But like, the you know, the cast was like, you know, we get it. That was great. Like, I thought the running gag of what could go wrong, like, would get fucking really tiresome. But the fact that it was mm -hmm. building up to, like, you know, his mm -hmm. amazing speech made it all worth it. Like, 
Um, you can totally see why that dude earned an Oscar. Oh, a hundred thousand percent. He needs more work. He does, and I hope with this he'll get more. Like, I don't know, I don't know about you, Brian, but like for the longest time before like the, the cast speech reveal thing, I kept thinking in the back mm -hmm. of my head, like, is he secretly some kind of mystical person? Is this why we keep well, cutting dude. to Freddy? Well, I don't know if it, it's a coincidence or not, but uh We did see him in the flashback. Yeah, in the dream. Oh. No, in the flashback. Oh yeah, in the flashback, yeah, yeah. So it could be him. He was the god of war. Yeah, it could be him. Could be him, or also could just be a, a coincidence, because the funny thing is, is, even though he didn't interact with any of the main characters, he was in every episode. Yep. Uh, Which was really cool and a bit of a subversion. Yeah. And also definitely play with the whole everything getting a reunion. And like, I also like the fact that like, you know, his message and his subplot was about representation, but it mm -hmm. didn't feel preachy. You know? No. Like it could have very easily fe uh, felt preachy. Oh. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. There was one time where he interacted with the main cast. In the, like, dream sequence. Yeah, yeah, in the dream sequence. Mm -hmm. Which was really well. Yep. Yeah, very well done. And I like... And I like how he kind of, like, indirectly mentored him. Yeah. And I, I love that, the like, the speech is what inspires uh, Jin. Like, and it wasn't, mm -hmm. like, convenience, you know? Like, it wasn't like, oh, look, this happens to be happening right now, right when he needs it. No, like... You know, the meme was a running, like, a running subplot for Jin the, this whole time, True. and it was connected to the show, so it would make sense that they show that meme when they're like, you know, you've been, you've gotten a lot really popular online recently with you becoming the, like, latest viral meme trend. And then the fact that he was also on TV. Yep. When they replayed the meme. Mm-hmm. So, like... You know, that didn't feel forced. Like, the speech felt very... Again, the speech felt very genuine. Mm -hmm. And, like... It didn't feel like... It was pandering to... See, Asian audience, we get it. Because, like... You know? An Asian creator... Was behind this. It felt like it came from mm -hmm. a real place. Like, real heart. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, it was really good. Um, and I do like how they, uh, they like alluded to it, but then only cut to it when it uh, made sense for the plot. Okay, so now let's, I mean, we already did jump into speculation a little bit, but now let's talk about what I really wanted to speculate about right now. So I have a pretty good idea of who... Uh, Wei Chen's mother is. And, uh, like, given the cliffhanger, that pretty much clinched it for me. Mm. So, I, uh, so, you know, how I put it together, and, you know, Brian saw it live via text, was the fact that I knew Princess Iron Fan was Chi Chi. And, you know, if you know your Dragon Ball, what makes Gohan? And if you know your Journey to the mm -hmm. West, Princess Iron Fan is a lover of Sun Wukong who also betrays Sun Wukong at various points as well. Well, also, to back up that theory, the first time that we see her, She's saving Sun Wukong. Yep. And they definitely have a very, uh, like, action hero love interest banter back and forth. Yep. 
And like, you know, it it was, you know, clearly hinted at in the flashback that she like she and Bull Demon like, you know, had a a friendship there. Like don't you know with the don't forget who helped you comment. Mm -hmm. So, like, I definitely think Princess Iron Fan is Wei Chen's mother, and I think that's why Wukong, both Wukong and Wei Chen never mentioned it. Because, you know, she's gone to the dark side, as it were. Mm -hmm. And, like, it just, you know, family drama and, like, Chen, uh, like generational trauma is a big theme for this show, so it would only make sense to parallel Wu oh, Jin yeah. and his parents solved bickering plot what by introducing a heavenly equivalent to that which you know if this prediction is true then i can rescind my complaint about the parent subplot because then it has an actual real purpose but well even then though dragged on a little too much oh yeah no, my, my, my main complaint of it, be, uh, like, overstaying is welcome is still there. But, like, my other complaint of why is this here is gone if this prediction is correct. Oh, yeah. I, I can get that. And also, uh, when they... Ooh. And here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Is, uh... The two friends are separated, so he can't count full his friend on it. Yep. Oh, uh, I we, we only briefly touched on it, but uh, another running joke that I thought was hilarious was mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie Shue's character, Madame Rocky, and her dog. Oh, that yeah. That shit was super funny. And then Michelle hits. Yeah. Like, what happened to our bandit? You don't want to know. It's like, uh, no, 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 no. Make him do a trick first. Tell him to spin or yeah. something. Push you, spin. And it does a little spin, yeah. and it's just like, all right, now you can feed him. Like that was great. Yeah, it it was. Um, Stephanie Shu deserves oh, more work also, too, and her comedic timing is so yes. good. Oh my god, dude, that dead man. Yep. But also speaking about things that we didn't mention, fun fact: uh, the episode, episode six, the one that uh, featured the birthday party. Mm -hmm. You'll never guess who directed that episode. Who? Lucy Liu. Oh shit! Awesome. Yeah. Um. When uh. When uh, she uh, did that TV show, Elementary, where she was the Watson. I remember. I watched that show. Uh, she started directing, and she's been, like, intermediately directing here and there. I think she also did a couple Mando episodes. Maybe. I remember seeing, like, hmm. big actor names other than Bryce Dallas Howard in directing credits for Mando. Hmm. She directed an episode of uh, New Amsterdam, Why Women Kill, SVU. Holy shit, Luke Cage? Oh, shit. She, direct she directed the season two premiere. Of Mando? I thought so. No, of uh, Luke Cage. Oh, Luke Cage? Oh, dope. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, like it was great. Uh, like the again, the comedic timing for Stephanie Hsu was fantastic. Mm. Just seeing her and Michelle Yao ba uh, like bounce off of each other again was just a a joy. It was a joy. Yeah, no pun intended. No pun completely intended. It's me, Brian. <laughs> didn't you notice that i hesitated before choosing my word and then i chose the word ah uh, uh, 
I'm the one who does it unintentionally. Yeah, no, I I am the Punisher, man. I I I do yeah. this whenever I can, as many times as I can. And I'm and I'm the one who dubbed you that. Uh, but 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 yeah, it was cool to see them again. Although I do wish that she had a bigger role. Yep. Uh, the other thing that I like, I hope is rectified in season two as a fan of journey to the west i want to mm -hmm. see more of the wukong gang like we got to see a little bit of sandy a little bit of pigsy where the fuck is horse horse is my favorite character i want to see horse give me horse also with speculation I wonder. I wonder uh, how many uh, like teenagers will be involved in searching. Yeah, I hope that they don't. Will. I hope they don't drag too many of the kids in, because like mm -hmm. I feel like as much as I like Nuge and I like Amelia, it would really weigh the like way the plot down if you had to do the whole explaining everything again like news it was easy because he was a weeb so like he instantly was like oh yeah. all right that makes sense but like I don't that's know. why i feel like um that's why i feel like protest girl would might have a bigger role because it's like oh you're dating news so yeah, we need news. Mm -hmm. You just happen to be there. I could yeah no I could see it happening like that. If it happens like that, I have no problem. Uh, but uh, but I yeah I don't yeah, the, I, I the, want the I want the, like, the high school kids to have their own high school involved. plot. Like yeah, the, that's my main. The soccer takeaway. kids don't need to be involved in the search. Like they can be like bystanders and spectators, like they were in the final fight, because that was fucking great. But, like, mm -hmm. you don't got to have them involved in the big mystical plot. The high, the normal high school plot is still important. I know I, like, made the joke and the complaint about we spent 90% of it in fucking high school. But, mm -hmm. like, without that 90%, we wouldn't have gotten the, the great character turnarounds and developments for some of these kids. Oh, yeah. So I do still think the high school is important. And we still haven't found out who the fuck the crane was that talked to Wei Chen. So that's why I think the high school is still going to be coming into big play. Yeah, because the crane is the high school master. Yep. Which, uh, which was also a thing, though, because even before knowing about the crane and everything, uh... The Mad Monk knew where. So I think the mascot. This is just my like big speculation. I think the mascot mm -hmm. is actually like legit the crane that told Wei Chen like the prophecy and like that you know what you call it. He'd find the fourth scroll at this random high school in California. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, because, like, uh, if you really think about it, right, he shows up in a lot of the pivotal moments where, like, Wei Chen, uh, not Wei Chen, but uh, Jin's journey is, like, really tested. And every time he's had a power flare up, the mascot has been somewhere in the vicinity. So, that's just my, was like... Was he goal. there on the field during the tryout? Yeah, because he's, uh, yeah, because he was, uh, like... He was he was with the because like I think the cheerleaders and them were there too. I don't think that was oh. I don't think that was a power flare up though. Like, I uh, mean, dude, dude, he jumped like five feet. Oh, I didn't see. I didn't. I was. I guess I wasn't paying that much attention. I shit. All right, so that was a power flare up. Shit, my bad. I stand corrected. Yeah, everybody was so surprised because he was supposed to be going for the ball. Yep. And when the other dude was like halfway there, he tackled him. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, but yeah, uh, he might not have been on the field, but I know I know he was there for at least two of them. Yeah, and the first flare up, at least Jin was uh, very uh, like emotional. Yeah, I mean he was emotional in all three, really. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the mascot faced the brunt of the mo uh, of the like last one before the like the scroll thing was revealed. So that's another reason. To why. be fair, mm -hmm. to be fair, in that one, the mascot was being a little bit a holy. Not really. He said, "He said, my bad, dude. High five. How is that being an asshole?" He didn't say my bad. He did say my bad. I didn't hear it. I but, heard it. Oh, well. It's longer for me to watch it than you, so. Yeah, I was going to say, I saw it more Pretty recently. Longer. So. So, yeah. All right. But, yeah, still. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be surprised. It would also be a cool little sneaky way for them to uh, possibly get a uh, famous actor. Uh-huh. Cause I mean we've had we've, and, we've had some fun disguises uh, for a lot of the mystical mm -hmm. people so far. So. But also, but also if if they retconned it and said that there was a famous person underneath there the whole entire time, we'd never know. Yeah, they could do like a whole mask singer type shit. Mm -hmm. So you think mask singer is fake? What? Who, who said that? Next thing you're going to tell me is the WWE is fake. Oh, man, Brian, you're trying to just break immersion everywhere. Now, to be fair, the last American Mask Singer, the one who won, is a legit, um, is a legit singer that I follow on Insta. Oh, cool. And, uh, she's really cool. Nice. And I really like her, and I really believe that that's her voice. So... But... Uh, so moving moving on uh, back into speculation. So other than the stuff with like Princess Iron Fan and you know what I mentioned with the crane, do you have mm -hmm. any like big theories going into season two? If we get one, please let us get one. Yeah. Um. I do think. I don't know if we said this or not, but uh, I do think that, I can uh, tell you that. Uh, the civilian, the kids. Oh, we mentioned that. Might see more of them. Yeah, we mentioned that. Yeah. Yep, we mentioned that. We talked about how um, the protest girl, now that she's with Nuge, is probably going to be involved mm -hmm. somewhat. And then I talked about how, mm -hmm. like, you know, I think that, you know, it's fine to have like Nuge and protest girl, but I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to throw in like. Amelia, Travis, Greg, and all the soccer bros. Amelia, Amelia, maybe. Like Amelia, but I could understand. Definitely the soccer bro. Yeah, Amelia, I can understand. Uh, like, because her arc is, you know, kind of like understanding and accepting her family, and when she sees how fucking crazy Wei Chen's family is, mm -hmm. and the stuff that Jin's family is tied into, she'll be like, "All right, my family's actually pretty normal." Yeah, and uh, and also I could see them possibly doing like some like kind of like uh, early Spider-Man uh, Invincible type shit where the Sire Bros have like a uh, subplot where they're trying to like explain away where Jin is. Oh man, that would be hilarious. Like, I would be cool with them knowing the secret and then them being like his cover. That would be fun. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm I'm down with that. That would be funny. Alright, so anything else in speculation before we jump into final thoughts? Maybe actually get to see more of the heavenly creatures and uh, get more time in Heaven. Oh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Give me the horse. I want to see the horse. Yeah. I want to see the entire crew. And also, where the fuck is Sanzo? 
you know, Wukong's guide, the original, like, is that actually Wei Chen's mom? Because Sanzo in the stories is, mo is most of the time a dude. However, when Sanzo is portrayed as in plays and such, Sanzo is often played by a female. So, could Sanzo be a woman and be Wukong's mom? They got very close in the story. They were best buds. So, it could be her, too. It, it might not be Iron Fan. So, that could also be interesting. Where's Sanzo at? Mm hmm Also, I wonder uh, if they'll get any more familiar faces. Chinese. Yep, yep. You know, maybe someone who's a... Uh worked heavily with Michelle Yao in the past. Yeah, I, I, I think that would be cool. And uh, A certain uh, Jackie? Yeah, Jackie. Or even, like, a, a fucking, like, if you guys remember that underrated, still pretty good movie, Forbidden Kingdom, my man Jet Li. What happened mm -hmm. to Jet Li? I would love to see Jet Li in something again. Oh, that would be so cool. Although, apparently he's been going through some shit. Oh, really? Dang. Sucks for Jet Li. Uh, he he uh, faced a health issue, which kind of, uh, like, rapidly aged him physically. Oh, no! I hope he's okay. We're we're rooting for you, Jet Li. You're one of my, you're one of my favorite you're one of my favorite action stars, mm -hmm. and I loved your video game despite its weird, janky spin to attack controls. Jet Li Rise to <laughs> Honor was my shit. Oh my god! Could you imagine if uh, if a uh, homeboy from Forbidden Kingdom, the main character, uh -huh. if he showed up? That would be cool. Because he's been in. Because he's been in a lot of Chinese stuff, also, even though he's not Chinese. Also, another popular Chinese actor that I just love in general, that I would love to see show up in some capacity of the show, is uh, Chow Young-Fat. Chow Young-Fat oh, yeah. is amazing. And he was the perfect casting for Master Roshi if, you know, he was in an actual good movie. Mm -hmm. But whatever. We're not going to talk about that abomination. Um. Also, I know that she's uh, she's faced some backlash for financial problems and tax stuff, but uh, Fan Bing Bing is always good. Yeah, Ming Na Wen also another another fan favorite. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, she wor she's worked with Disney pretty often. One of their most iconic princesses. Mm hmm. Uh. She just got done being, uh, Finnick or Shand, is yeah. still doing. Finnick Shand, yeah. True, true, true. Because the fate of her and Boba is kind of up in the air. Yep, it's unknown. So yeah, like, she's still working with Disney, so hey, call me now. Yeah, call me now when, man. Like, I think it'd be cool. I would love to see, like, Ming Na Wen fight Michelle Yao. <laughs> oh, that would be... <laughs> That'd be fucking mm. sick. Also, also, uh, I just thought about it. If they uh, actually did uh, the mentor, mm -hmm. and they made him a male, mm -hmm. that might be a good place for Jackie. Oh yeah, he could be Sanzo. Yeah, he could be Sanzo if they make him like a you know, since Wu Kong aged, it would make sense for uh, you know Sanzo to age as well if they make him a dude. Mm -hmm. And like it would be cool for like Jin being Wei Chen's guide to meet Wu Kong's guide, and like trade advice and shit. That'd be dope. Mm -hmm. You know, especially now that the guide is in trouble. Oh yeah. I mean, who knows? Maybe the reason we haven't seen him is because he got captured. <laughs> mm -hmm. And maybe that's what happened to the other members of the Wu Kong gang. That's not their actual name, but that's what I'm calling them until they give me an official name. And uh, what if one of the plots is uh, Jen teaming up with them oh, that to would, escape? That would be dope as hell. So, anything else uh, before we jump into final thoughts and ratings? Well, it's kind of funny because you're more versed in this mythos than I am. So, I'm just going off of my like TV knowledge and hopes. I'm honestly not versed in Chinese mythology in general. This just happens to focus on Journey to the West, the one story that I've seen like a bajillion adaptations of. Which, speaking of, 
it might be nice if they included more of the gods. Yeah. Because we saw, we saw a few of them in the uh, flashback, but those were just like brief cameos. Oh, we didn't talk about it that deeply because, I mean, Tony mentioned it really quick before he dipped earlier, but the flashback was amazing. I love the like 70s mm. action show Miami, like like 70s, early 80s, like Miami Vice style like lighting and intro it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. uh just seeing wukong and bull demon get into their shenanigans i really liked it yep how that tied into the overall plot mm -hmm. even though they kind of uh undermined it with the you know last two episodes yeah which was so funny the way that tony phrased that i know i it's... i tried so hard. i had to like really focus on nope I, that's why I muted. I was like, mm -mm. turn it off my mic mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. But the minute that he was gone, we were like, yeah, so. Uh... That's why I was like, are you going to say what I'm going to say? Because if you're going to say what I'm going to say, go ahead. Uh, and I did. Oh, that was good. Good shit. Good shit. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, final thoughts and ratings. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with you, Brian. All right. Like we said, it was really good. It had a lot of good, like, kung fu fighting, wire fu scenes. Uh, I mean, granted, who our leads are and uh, the uh, who our leads are and who the director is, which, uh, by the way, we never mentioned it, but Lei Chen, actor, holy crap. Yeah, right? Wei Chen is fucking insane in terms of like the action scenes like all of his fights were yeah. really dope yeah i mean he can't stack From up to donnie yen but that's fucking donnie yen yeah and the only time that he did somewhat was because he had the magical staff on his side yep but he still got clapped 100 percent. but anyway so that was good and the comedy, for the most part, was good. Yeah, no, I had genuine laughs at a lot of stuff. I think certain jokes went on for a little too long. Mm-hmm. And, and the final... One too yeah, many. And the final joke really pissed me off. Yeah. And all the drama was really well done, even though some of it was not necessary. Parent subplot. Yeah. Granted, like it, I said what, earlier, if like if the parent subplot ends up like actually connecting them somewhere important and like paralleling yeah. with like Wu Kong and his wife's drama, I'll rescind this complaint. And the bull demon thing kinda petered yeah. in the end where let let's be honest. He he became kind of similar to those uh, dime a dozen MCU villains that usually die. He became he, he became your standard OG Dragon Ball villain. All right, Goku, yeah. I'm gonna take over the world. Mm -hmm. like, Some men just want to watch the world burn, which is weird. And I know we already talked about this, but I just want to say it one more time. It's so weird that like yeah. He was so nuanced, and there were moments of hesitation here and there, so you knew he wasn't all bad, but, like, he was still going to go through with the plan because, you know, he's going to stick to his guns because that was his, you know, problem before. But my issue with it is, like, afterwards, mm -hmm. even though he, you know, lost... He's. I was expecting him to take the L on the chin, still want to be evil and commit his plan and be like, you know, in the background because he knows, you know, in his head that Iron Fan is going to, you know, kidnap Jin's parents because he had a contingency plan. But then he just kind of turned into some wahaha, I'm evil, not showing any of the like nuance that he had mm -hmm. before. That's kind of that's kind of weak. Now, if they Almost. flip it around in next season, I can change my mind. Yeah, and it almost felt like at one point that they were just doing that so they could have the big, epic, uh, effects-heavy. 
I mean, finale. and that was a dope ass fight. Like, don't get me wrong. It was. It it really was. Which I did also. We didn't mention this before, but I did find it interesting that we had a whole kung fu show. Yet the main character didn't learn kung fu. Yeah, I thought that yeah. too. I was like, so you you have a friend who is a clear kung fu prodigy. You, I mean, I granted he just discovered his powers at like the very end, so he didn't really have time to train. So maybe yeah. that'll be season two. So I'm not but really gonna I do like that subversion. Yeah, although he's gonna learn kung fu. Like, yeah. no way in hell he's not going to learn Kung Fu. I mean, obviously. But, uh... But, yeah. Like you said, there are some things with the bad stuff, like with the bull demon and the parents where if season two comes along and goes a certain way, it can excuse it. Yep. But... And make it somewhat better. And do we have, it, think... do we have any confirmation on a renewal yet? Do you know? Nope. Ah, oh, shit. Nope. No word yet. Damn it. Though all the actors really want it. So do we. Yes. But given as of right now the way that season one is, oh, having a season two in retrospective, which is, is weird because it's one of the few times where I can say that my rating might change in the future. Yes. Yeah, depending on how things are. Same. As of right now, and this feels weird to say it because I'm saying it like two weeks in a row, but as of it's for different reasons. But as of right now, I, if I'm going with my gut here, give it a flat eight. Huh. Okay. History strikes again. We are all in unison. Oh, damn. Because I like. I like right after I finished, I was like, all right, this is a solid eight out of ten. Uh, you know, not to just repeat all the points Brian brought up, uh, but you know, kind of just to resummarize my thoughts all throughout the episode. Like a lot of the stuff was very powerful, like the the subplot with short rounds actor and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, like the relatable representation of teenage characters. I'm not even just speaking in from a Rachel's perspective, but the fact that these felt like real kids, you know, uh, uh, oh, yeah. you definitely, you know, people definitely have gone through shit like this in high school. It was like, it was tropey, but they didn't play it up to where this felt like this was something made for TV. You know, I, I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Uh, the action scenes were phenomenal. I loved all the mythological stuff, being a fan of journey to the West, uh, all that stuff was really cool. I wish we got to see more of it, but all of it was really cool. So and they weren't afraid to show us their like real forms. Yeah, yeah. And like I also appreciated that like of course, you know, since they're Chinese mythological figures, their default language is Chinese. Mm hmm So like that was dope. Yeah, so overall, it's a great show and if those problems are corrected in season two, I'm probably going to up my score to like an 8.5 or a 9. But mm -hmm. for now, it's going to sit at a flat 8. Which, you yeah. know, it's funny. Tony gave it that score without even seeing the bull demon thing. So I wonder if it's going to lower after the bull demon thing. Hmm. We'll have to tune in next week to find out. Speaking of next week, yeah. what are we uh, covering next week, Brian? Tell the folks at home. Well, here's the thing. Due to our, uh, due to our, like, uh, busy schedule with a lot of things coming out, we kind of have a little bit of a caveat here. Peek behind the curtain a little. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, our original plan is to do Superman and Lois Season 3. Yep. However... Uh, as we've uh, mentioned several times, our buddy Tony is a busy man, so if he can't watch it in time, Jay and I will cover it in a separate video, and our main video will be They Clone Tyrone. Yep, the Netflix original movie starring Monica Rambeau's actress, 
Jamie Foxx and John Boyega. Brian mentioned it briefly yep. in screen time, and uh, he gave it a glowing review and recommendation. So, you know, if we're short on time, a movie's easy to go through, and I'm looking forward to checking it out myself. And I'm also looking forward to hearing Brian's thoughts on Puss in Boots' Last Wish. Don't think I forgot, Brian. <laughs> So, look forward to all that next week. But until then, we'll catch you guys later. Peace. Hope you have a good rest of your week.